Good morning. It is Wednesday, December 14th here in New York City. This is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith and Brian Sazi. Let's get right to the top three things you need to know as the clock hits 9 a.m. Futures, they're searching for direction ahead of the Federal Reserve's final decision day of the year. The Fed will announce its policy decision, as always, at 2 p.m. Plus, more drama in the crypto world. Binance's CEO, CZ, says things have stabilized at his cryptocurrency exchange, but warns the next few months will be bumpy for the industry. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, new FTX CEO John Ray made some stark comments yesterday. Take a listen. This is really old-fashioned embezzlement. This is just taking money from customers and using it for your own purpose. Not sophisticated at all. And speaking of bumpy rides, Tesla shares have been sliding this year and are down almost 30% since Elon Musk took over Twitter. We got you covered with deep analysis on the EV maker. But of course, let's begin with the biggest story of the day, and that is naturally the Federal Reserve. The Fed is set to complete its final policy meeting of the year today, with investors widely expecting the central bank to slow the pace of rate hikes as inflation shows signs of cooling. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance Fed correspondent Jen Schomberger for a preview here. Jen. Good morning, Ryan. Live here from chilly Washington, where in this building behind me, Fed officials are reconvening for a second day of their two day policy meeting, their last policy meeting of the year, where they're expected to slow down the pace of rate hikes, but signal that they will move higher on the Fed funds rate. Officials expected to raise their benchmark interest rate, the Fed funds rate, by half a percentage point. That would bring the Fed funds rate up to a new range of four and a quarter to four and a half percent. That would be the highest level since December 2007. Now, this meeting likely to usher in a new phase of slower rate hikes after the Fed raised rates by a blistering 75 basis points in each of the past four meetings, the fastest pace since the 1980s. Now, all eyes will be set on a new set of interest rate projections, that so-called dot plot, cluing investors into how high officials see rates rising. Chair Powell has said that rates will need to raise hot rise higher than the 4.6 percent previously projected in September. Investors will also get new sets of estimates on inflation, GDP and the economy. Now, with inflation showing signs of cooling, Fed Chair Powell likely to be peppered with questions of if the Fed does move by 50 basis points in this afternoon's meeting, whether they could slow down to 25 basis point increments and ultimately when he sees the Fed pausing rate hikes. The decision comes down at 2 p.m. with Fed Chair Powell's press conference at 2.30. Back to you. Thanks, Jen. And I just want to go back to something that happened yesterday as well, because, of course, we got the Consumer Price Index yesterday morning, but futures started to move a little bit beforehand, which led to a lot of speculation that the data might have been leaked, so much so that actually the the, uh, press secretary was asked about it. Yeah. Hey, good morning, Julie. That's right. There are reports that the consumer price index may have been leaked uh, before it was set to come out at 830 yesterday morning. Observers pointing to a surge in treasuries. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which puts out that report, says they're not aware of a leak. And the White House echoing that, saying they did not leak the report. White House Press Secretary um, Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters in the White House briefing yesterday afternoon that perhaps observers are looking too much into the surge in Treasuries. Take a listen. Look, you know, I, I think we think that it's it's being a little bit, um, uh, uh, how do I say, it's, uh, you know, I think there's too much, too much weight being put into that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and how the market may have moved in a minor way. Uh, you know, I don't I don't really have much more to add uh, to that, uh, but I have seen the reports on it. And uh, again, I think it's just being a little bit uh, we're, we're looking into it a little bit too much, I think. Well, there you have it, Julie. Yeah, there you are. Interesting. Interesting reaction, wasn't it? Jen, thanks so much. And of course, we are going to yeah. check in with you throughout the day. And of course, after we hear from the Fed as well, go get go get warm for a little bit until until we hear it's from you again, Jen. Thanks so uh, much. Yeah, I'm going to go warm up. It's pretty cold out here. <laughs> I know it. I know it. All right. Thanks, Jen. Um, let's talk a little bit more, guys, about what we're expecting from the Fed and the effect it could have in the markets. I mean, despite that number that we got from uh, CPI yesterday, which was reassuring, 
whenever people got the information, be it that as it may. Um, it doesn't seem to have changed the perception of what the Fed is going to do. No, and Fed Chair Jerome Powell has been extremely vocal, at least recently, and, and not trying to mince words about how they are going to continue on the course until the pathway or until the job is done. Uh, and they're not trying to have a slip up that we've seen in the past. You think about the late 60s into the early 70s even, when it seemed like there had been a point where inflation, or at least on the CPI front, had peaked only to then run higher yet again. And then you had a changeover in some of the Fed shares there between Martin and Burns. And then the job was still very much, okay, how do we dampen down? And it really came through some aggressive rate hikes as well thereafter. And so similarly, looking back through history now, Fed Chair Jay Powell, even in the slip up in transitory that's already taken place in trying to continue to reestablish credibility. It's how do we keep the foot on the pedal and not really take it off the gas? Right? Two days in a row of Arthur Burns shout outs on uh, you know, Yahoo Finance. All right, I like, dig it, I dig it. I was getting ready to order Jen uh, some uh, uh, coffee from a uh, uh, PSL from Starbucks. She was looking so cold, but look, uh, this market has been hot on this expectation, I think Jerome Powell comes up here today and he signals maybe we only get a 25 basis point rate hike at that February meeting. The market is well off the lows. You see the VIX back down to 20. We've seen tech stocks not named Tesla rallying nicely off the lows and looking right at Meta. That stock has moved very hard, I think, on this expectation that by the middle of next year, these rate cuts are just done. I don't know if they're done. Rate hikes. Great, right, right yeah. hikes, done. No more hikes. <laughs> yeah. So they just stop. They just hold at their current position. Yeah. And then by the fourth quarter uh, of next year, we're looking at potential rate cuts, right. which would be signaled at some point in the third quarter. Right. And it's really where the trend starts to really lock into place, too. And how much of time, how much, what period of time uh, is really going to make that trend and, yeah. and satisfy the Fed on that front? I'm always crazy until the stuff happens. I get it. I understand. I get it. <laughs> well, we'll almost, yeah. or maybe it won't. I, I, I mean, yeah. No, it's not that you're crazy. It's just that everybody else is, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, it's not I a job. I don't make that, predictions, as you know. And, and certainly not a job that we envy <laughs> being the Fed chair right now. Also, everyone, we're tracking uh, Binance CEO CZ, or Changpeng Zhao, who is reassuring customers that the situation on their exchange, on Binance, has now stabilized and deposits are coming back in. This announcement, it comes after the company paused withdrawals of a stablecoin as investor concerns grew around the future of crypto here. And of course, that concern around the future of crypto as it relates to stablecoins, it certainly comes after the fallout from FTX as that continues to move forward kind of in parallel. There is this larger question of what terms and conditions the companies, the Bitcoin, or not Bitcoin, but the crypto exchanges more broadly can lean into to say that they have the they have the opportunity or they have the need to pause withdrawals um, and where customers just have to be fine with that, at least in this near term. But it seems like they're just leaning on what the customer agreement has been to this point in time, too. Yeah, I mean, and and there, Binance has taken some steps to try to reassure people, right? It came out with its proof of reserves, which is something that those in the crypto community view as, you know, letting you know what is backing up mm -hmm. the organization. And of course, CZ has been very vocal. He did another Twitter spaces this morning, which he has done a lot of, but it hasn't, I mean, if you look at the outflows that are happening, it, they're still happening, right? If you look at the amount, record daily net outflow of both Bitcoin and Ether in terms of the number of tokens, that happened yesterday. So, you know, I, I think people are watching John J. Ray yesterday mm -hmm. in front of the House Financial Services Committee. They are looking at the arraignment of Sam Bankman Freed down in the Bahamas and seeing that he's been uh, denied bail. They're, you know, people are, are gun shy no matter what any particular exchange is going to be saying. Let's quickly mention, too, uh, Binance declined to make CZ available for an interview, also did not return our request for comment on them. Uh, there was an internal memo floating around uh, that CZ put out to his staff, so uh, they did not send that along to us. But I will mention this. Look, I mean, it's, it's, you have to wonder, is this going to be another liquidity event for Binance? Uh, obviously, not, I would say not potentially in the same uh, vein or, or situation as an FTX, but still a concern that keeps uh, crypto prices 
from recovering here. It's just this continued lack of confidence in the entire space. What was also interesting is that even as you had the FTX proceedings going forward without SBF, SBF had actually uh, released a statement that he was set to make, and Forbes got a hold of, the, of this testimony that he was going to make if present. And CZ was mentioned a lot within that statement. It seemed like SBF really was looking to perhaps take down a few people along with himself, but not to the same kind of detriment, of course. Um, and he talked about some of the false claims that he believes CZ has made about his equity in FTX, about the intentions and in looking to acquire FTX as well. Um, and so this really, as we still do have a spat at the top of the kind of titan list within crypto, and it comes back to what one of our guests told us last week. If crypto can be made or broken based on the profile of a few people who sit at the top, then that goes counter to exactly what this decentralized financial play and, and broader industry and sector build out has been around. And so I think that is critical even as we do continue to listen to some of the proceedings that go forward from here too. Um, and by the way, we talked, I mentioned the House Financial Services Committee yesterday. John J. Ray was the main um, witness there. Today, the Senate Banking Committee is going to tackle the question of what happened with FTX and what the fallout is, among other people. They're going to be talking to Kevin O'Leary, who we, who you spoke to yeah. um, last week, I believe it was, as well as a couple of academics. So that should be interesting. We will, of course, be tracking that uh, when it begins. Number three this morning, Tesla. It's seen a major decline in its stock price since uh, CEO Elon Musk took the reins at Twitter on October 27th. Stock is down 28% since that deal closed. And it's falling again this morning after Goldman Sachs cut its price target on the company by almost a quarter to $235, down from a prior target of 305 By various metrics, the stock is now trading at its lowest valuation ever, depending on how you sort of um, look at it here. And um, Elon Musk is no longer the richest man in the world. That's Bernard Arnault of LVMH. So all of this happening sort of in the past few days with this latest leg down for Tesla. And really, I would say a lot of analysts outside of our friend of the show, Dan Ives, have been, I would say, tepid or scared to make a strong call on Elon Musk and Tesla uh, as a result of everything he's doing at Twitter. But here's Goldman really uh, coming out here. I, I'm not slamming uh, it, but really raising the question a lot of investors have been wondering, uh, what happens if he is in fact distracted? How do these next couple quarters look like for Tesla? Goldman noting uh, this is uh, now become, uh, Tesla's brand has become more polarizing because of Musk uh, and what he he's doing at Twitter, and they see that now as an increasing risk to the stock. So should Elon Musk even still be the, if you will, chief marketing officer by de facto basis because of how much his personal brand has been annexed to the brand of Tesla? And that's exactly what it had been for so long. You would, We had looked at stock price reactions even when the SEC had their spat with Elon Musk because of the tweet going private, funding secured, and then the ramifications that came there afterwards, because there was a thought about what happens to Tesla if Elon Musk is not there. Now you're looking at a different scenario. What happens for Tesla if Elon Musk is not there? Does this become a car company, an automotive company, or just a power company that is able to now relinquish itself of any of the sideshow that's taking place and perhaps have a more concerted focus around producing vehicles, around expansion geographically, and just continuing to add on to the perception that it's been able to take on thus far, at least in revolutionizing what the EV space and looks like. He's not going anywhere. He owns Twitter. I mean, he owns Twitter. But at what point, if you're Tesla's board and you've watched almost $280 billion in market cap wiped off the stock this year, at what point do these friend, does this friendly uh, Musk board over Tesla say, you know what, Elon, it's time to appoint your successor. You want to focus on Twitter, you want to focus on turning this company around, maybe you should, but we need an operator who can devote 120% of the time on executing on these plans you have laid out for this brand. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, there's there's reporting this morning that um, over at Twitter, Musk is refusing to pay rent on some of the properties. He's refusing to pay for private charter flights that occurred during the week of his takeover, um, you know, and sort of gearing up for legal battles over these various items. And how does that feed back into Tesla? Well, that Goldman call that I mentioned this morning, they're still buy rated on Tesla, by the way. Um, they talk a little bit about Twitter. The call mostly seems to be about supply and demand, that the Goldman analysts are lo are looking at 420,000 deliveries in the fourth quarter of 2022, which is a lowering of their forecast. And the same time, they talk about Tesla's brand becoming more polarizing. They think 
think they still has they think it still has significant value um, because of the company's leadership position. But obviously, they are watching it, and more investors and analysts are watching the relationship between the two mm -hmm. and the effect that the sort of feedback loop from the Twitter ownership to the reputation of Tesla. Even more than them not paying rent, it, apparently he's now going to be auctioning off some items, furniture from Twitter's headquarters as well, which is just another wrinkle. Good for him clamping down on costs there. Holy knows what rates those rents were signed, top of the market when Twitter offices were full. Good for Elon here. He's good good for, Elon. for Elon for just saying, well, I'm maybe, not going to well, pay? No, maybe he needs to renegotiate, renegotiate these, these rent releases. Then you renegotiate. You don't just say, I'm not paying rent. That's how he you don't those. walk in with the kitchen sink. I don't say I agree with it, but but he has to probably bring down the cost. You just said good for him. Good for him on, <laughs> on thinking of a way to bring down the cost in this business. They've been high, uh, Julie, for, for since the company's been founded, they have lost tons and tons of money. And it starts with decisions on how much they're going to pay for rent. As small as it might seem, that's an important thing. All right, we'll see how much they make from selling 800 items. I've been waiting all morning to say that. shape no, I'm done. At Twitter. Guys, coming up, the new CEO of FTX faced Congress yesterday on the collapse of the crypto platform. We're going to speak with the Kinetic representative, Jim Himes, who attended the hearing. That's next. We don't know where all of our wallets are. Um, uh, passwords were sometimes uh, kept in, in just plain text format. So this company was sort of uniquely positioned to fail. That was FTX CEO John Ray responding to Representative Jim Hines' question yesterday at the congressional hearing on the collapse of FTX. John Ray detailing the lack of record keeping and internal control at the company. Let's bring in Representative Hines now to discuss. Representative, thanks for taking the time after a big hearing yesterday that I imagine much of the American public was paying attention to and probably would have loved to heard from SBF as well. Uh, we, we know that there's something else going on with uh, jailing and detention detaining going there in the Bahamas, but from what you heard from the current FTX CEO, what were your biggest takeaways and what the American public should know about the situation right now, too? 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think if Sam Bankman Fried hadn't been otherwise occupied yesterday morning, we would have had a much more interesting set of hearings. You know, Mr. Ray, if you watch the hearing, um, you know, he basically delivered one message. He answered the question for us of what happens when you take a bunch of 20 somethings who've never run a business before and you give them many billions of dollars. Right. Um, you know, uh, it was just remarkable to hear him talk about stuff that doesn't really have to do uh, with all of the novelty of cryptocurrency and crypto assets. He was talking about the fact that they didn't even really have an accounting department. You know, they didn't have any internal controls. It sort of feels like money went into their condo in the Bahamas, got parceled out to buy stadiums or to buy whatever else they wanted to buy without anybody doing any oversight whatsoever uh, around the way the business operated. And I know that's not sexy cryptocurrency stuff, but boy, is there a lesson there, particularly for the customers who have now lost a lot of money. And remarkably, I, I tried to make this point yesterday, the supposedly super smart money that invested in this um, operation, the Sequoias, the Lightspeeds, um, you know, apparently never saw audited financial statements because there were no audited financial statements. And Congressman, all of this was was interesting, to say the least. But what role does Congress have to play in all of this? Because it seems like it was sort of a garden variety fraud, right? At least allegedly, right? A, a, a pretty big one. But still, with all for all this talk of regulation, it just seems like it was against existing law, right? Yeah, that's right. And of course, it's complicated by the fact that, that FTX.com was a Bahamas-based entity, which supposedly forbade U.S. investors from operating on their platform. That, that creates some jurisdictional issues. But the, the overall answer to your question is really clear, which is that it is now time, in fact, it's way past time, for all of these entities, whether they're based in New York or Los Angeles or the Bahamas or the Netherland Antilles, it is time for all of these um, uh elements of the plumbing of the crypto cryptocurrency uh, world to be under somebody's regulatory jurisdiction. And, you know, the SEC has been pretty clear. Gary Gensler has been pretty clear that he believes he has authority. I understand that the industry feels like there's a little ambiguity there. But one way or another, it's time to solve that question of who has regulatory oversight and make sure that these entities are operating with some semblance of oversight. Congressman, uh, a new market watch uh, analysis out this morning noted that during the this past election cycle, SBF gave almost $40 million to Democratic politicians or groups and just over 200000 to Republicans. We'll love to get your thoughts on that. And how do we prevent that from happening in the future? Well, um, sadly, the answer to that question is um, we probably don't, right? We have a political system, partly thanks to the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United to equate the giving of money to people like me with First Amendment protected political speech uh, when the Supreme Court does that, they basically make it very hard to stop that activity. That's a whole other conversation. What I will tell you is this. We won't ever know, but I got asked the question yesterday. Well, because Sam Bankman-Fried gave a lot of money to members of Congress, would you guys have been gentle on him? No, I promise you, had Sam, Bank Sam Bankman-Fried showed up yesterday, uh, it would have been pretty ugly, regardless of who he did or did not give money to. Congressman, did you take money from SBF? And, and would you or do you think some of your colleagues should... Give the money back. So um, I, I uh, did not personally uh, get money from Sam Bankman Fried. Many of my colleagues did. He was a regular presence on the um, uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, it's interesting. We saw another indictment yesterday suggesting that a lot of the money he gave to members of Congress came out of the corporation itself, not out of his personal funds, which is a violation of the law. So, um, again, I'm fortunately not in the position of having to make the decision, but given given all that's occurred, I would certainly, had I been a recipient of his uh, direct giving, uh, would, be, would be finding a way to give it back. You mentioned that he was a frequent presence on Capitol Hill, and, and that is noteworthy because of how he was also trying to framework some of the future of crypto legislation. And within that, do you believe that there are components of that because of his involvement that should be thrown out or that should be held on to as there still needs to clearly be more regulation around crypto? Well, look, um, whatever you think of Sam Bankman Freed, um, and there will be lots of opinions out there, very, very bright guy. And he did play a role. I know this is not the moment to be complimenting the guy, but he did play a role in taking a Congress, which four years ago knew absolutely nothing about crypto assets and cryptocurrency and helping in the process of educating the Congress. Um, now, we're not done there yet, um, but, but you know, and it wasn't just Sam Bankman-Fried. It was many others who sort of came to Congress to try to educate 
a bunch of lay people, that's me, uh, on a very technical and kind of esoteric thing. Um, you know, so now it's time for us to, to actually put that knowledge uh, to work and make sure that, again, this whole this industry can be brought into the regulatory framework that will give um, investors and customers some confidence that they want to play in that realm. Um, and Congressman, I, I do want to switch gears finally and just ask you about another piece of legislation um, that's been introduced in Congress that um, has to do with TikTok and potentially banning TikTok in the United States. Um, I know that you are on the um, Intelligence Committee, so I'm just curious what you think of TikTok and whether you think that is a step that the U.S. should be taking. Yeah, look, I think I think the first thing I don't I don't have a personal TikTok, right? I sit on the intelligence committee. I am presumably a target of uh, interest to the Chinese um, state, and and people need to remember that um, in this country we have a bright line between government and the private sector. There's no such bright line in China, right? Basically, any company operating in China or with significant Chinese ownership or Chinese ties can get a call from the Chinese Communist Party to say, guess what? You're in the service of the government right now. So. I think the first step is for anybody who's in a sensitive position to be to, to acknowledge that and maybe to think twice about uh, about, you know, doing business or, or being involved with TikTok. Um, you know, it's a pretty severe uh, thing to for the, you know, you know, let's say the Treasury to say that you can't do business with this company. I think you'd want to let the due process uh, run. Uh, out uh, before you put a blanket prohibition uh, on that. Remember, I mean, I've got two daughters, both of whom seem to spend an inordinate amount of time on TikTok. So I'm not saying yes or no to that. I'm just saying, let's, you know, that's the kind of thing you you really undertake a lot of due process to make sure you're getting it right. All right, we'll leave it there. Representative Jim Himes, good to see you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Straight ahead, Delta is flying into the new year with some profit momentum. More on that and the opening bell on Wall Street next. Just a few moments till the opening bell on Wall Street, and it looks like futures are indicating a higher open, although everything could change, of course, once we hear from the Fed this afternoon. It is broadly expected, as we've been discussing, that the Fed is going to announce a rate increase of 50 basis points, or half a percent. And 
even though we got sort of more benign inflation numbers yesterday, is likely going to stay the course, you guys, in terms of coming, um, keeping with this interest rate increase cycle till we get to that terminal rate that is measurably higher than where we are today. Yeah, markets really lost some of the excitement yesterday after the early morning jump that we saw on the back of CPI. And so now it's kind of this just obscurity that we might find ourselves in until that 2 p.m. hour when we hear more from the Fed as well. And there you have the opening bell on this Wednesday morning, this Fed day, if you will, um, as we see futures kind of bounce around a little bit here this morning. Allison Transmission ringing the opening bell. And, of course, we're going to be paying attention not only to the overall averages today. We're going to be watching bond yields, of course, and we'll be watching some of the interest rate sensitive sectors. You know, it's funny, like a decade ago, certainly during the last tightening cycle that we had or the last easing cycle, you didn't think of big tech necessarily as interest rate sensitive, right? It's not something that normally classically fell into that basket, but it is very much interest rate sensitive now. And we have seen uh, the NASDAQ really move much more uh, sensitively to interest rate changes. Yeah, that's spot on. Well, the final big Fed day here in America and taking a look at the NASDAQ composite, we are flat just barely to the downside. Final Fed day, at least in 2022. We got much more in 2023 and beyond. But the Dow Jones, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, you're seeing that flat, but to the upside, it's up by about one-tenth of a percent right now over the past two days, still holding on to gains of about half a percent. And then the S&P 500, you're seeing that flat just barely holding on to some gains as well right now, up by just about two points, we'll call it. Let's take a look at some of those S&P 500 sectors, the 11 S&P 500 sectors. Mixed right now, it looked like out of the gate here, you've got more advancers than decliners early in today's trading activity. Energy, that's up by about 1% right now. However, bringing up the caboose, you've got communication services out of the gate down by about nine tenths of a percent. We'll keep a close eye on that. Real estate also down by about three tenths of a percent. NASDAQ composite here, just taking a look at some of the mega cap tech stocks. Yeah, you've got a little bit of a mixed equation there. Amazon is higher as well as Microsoft fractional percentage move there. Apple down by about two tenths of a percent. Of course, a lot of movement on the app store there. We'll break that down a little bit for you, a uh, little bit more for you later on in today's show. And then just lastly, checking in on crypto, we'll ride out on that given the uh, conflux of news that is continuing to come out within the crypto landscape right now. Bitcoin just slightly higher by about one tenth of a percent. Right. Imagine if there were there were no more Fed meetings. Just, imagine just done. It was just imagine no more if, Fed meetings. You know no what? more Fed commerce. Maybe just That's no it. more Fed at all. Just no more Fed. Not doing it. Not yeah. doing it. All right. Well, we are doing. It. We're going to serve up a little bit of analysis on Delta as investors eye the stock as CEO Ed Bastian and his team hold a key investor day. Companies out this morning with a guidance raise. And, and Brad, over to you here. You are our uh, chief Delta correspondent here. You covered the story. Your story is on our homepage. Good to see them raising guidance. And that dovetails, I think, nicely with what Scott Kirby, United CEO, said yesterday. Travel demand remains very strong. Yeah, business class Brad over here uh, with a little bit of the breakdown. <laughs> and really, it comes down to what they're forecasting in this current quarter. Of course, we've got just weeks left in at least their quarter. Um, but as we're wrapping that up there, Confident enough to say that earnings per share are going to come in at this range of a dollar thirty-five cents to a dollar forty cents, and that's versus what you saw in the previous guidance that they had provided at the end of their September quarter. What's also interesting is that Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta Airlines, said that demand for air travel that remains robust as they exit the year, and Delta's momentum is building here. Uh, and then just lastly, they also, in looking out to the next two years, because they gave kind of a three-year update here, including 2022. 2023 and 2024. In 2023, they're looking to see that free cash flow come in in excess of $2 billion. And then by 2024, expecting that to reach over $4 billion as well. And so uh, really some significant guidance. And we've got even more news that may come out of their investor day later on today. So keep it locked here. But at least on this news, we've got a write up on the Yahoo Finance uh, website already right now. So give that uh, a good look, good read. This is even as, by the way, airline fares have been falling month, month over month, exactly. which is quite interesting. That came out in the CPI yesterday. It doesn't feel like it anecdotally, I have to say, but um, fares were down 3% month over month last month. Um, Hammered all the stocks, Julie, yesterday. United Airlines, yeah. Southwest, Southwest Delta, even United, a really big announcement for them. 200 wide body jets, market can care less. Stock fell 7%. Well, and, and you know, so that means that sort of um, capacity discipline is going 
to be important going yes. forward, right? Yeah. If we are seeing a little bit of a pullback in fares, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any pullback in demand, but in past times, the airlines have gotten a little capacity happy. Yeah, even within this note uh, and, and within the release, they had said that they're looking to have full restoration of their capacity by 2023. Now, some of the expectations, at least from my conversation with Ed Bastian at the end of last quarter, we're looking at about six to nine months from that point. So from October, six to nine months, which puts us somewhere in the summer, perhaps, of 2023. And that is good news to a lot of summer travelers' ears out there, perhaps, and especially if airlines fares do continue to come down. One of the other major things that that hinges on is where that pilot, um, the pilot shortage starts to be um, kind of remedied for as well. They had so many pilots that were in training uh, and there's only so much of the simulators that they have to go around. And so it's really um, just not the not just the fleet that they have, but where they're positioning pilots within that training uh, to really correspond with the existing fleet that is there and present. I want you to know, Brad, for every Delta report, that I read for the rest of my life, however long that might be, I will think of business class bread Thank for you. every report, and it's just going to happen. I appreciate that. I love it. It's great. I like that. All right, let's talk about how home builders as well this morning. Shares of Lennar, we're watching those. Um, that stock got upgraded over Barclays, still only up about three quarters of a percent. But Barclays analysts now give the home builder an overweight rating. They also raised the price target to 116. And the analysts at Barclays saying that valuations have priced in a sharp housing recession. They're now more positive. They said the time is now to get into this group. So it looks like Lennar and Pulte have been downgraded to overweight um, because of this point in the cycle here. So, you know, it's always tough to call timing of these situations, but it looks like Barclays is doing that, that it's once in a cycle opportunity to get in here. Strong words, yeah. strong words. Uh, and the early cycle outperformance phase of home builder stocks, what they're citing within that note too. Um, and so for what we've seen in terms of the demand for homes, it still is going to come down, especially for Lennar, KB Homes, uh, Toll Brothers, the ability to produce those homes. And even within Toll Brothers, what we heard weeks back is that within that time frame, sure, the delivery has been pushed out because of the ability to get the necessary materials. Um, but the backlog of demand that they do have as well, uh, still showing some strength there. It's just a matter of how much they continue to see new orders or, uh, or new purchases for those homes start to be financed as well, too. Yeah, I'll just look at the valuation real quickly. Uh, you go to the stats page on the Lennar ticker page, and the stock's trading about seven times forward earnings. The broader market's about 19 times. So a lot of these stocks, Pulte, Lennar, uh, Toll Brothers, they've been hammered this year, and rightfully so. I mean, the housing market has really slowed across the board here. Uh, but at what point are these stocks just too cheap? Uh, they're making a big call. Obviously, they have just gotten too cheap. Big call there. Let's talk about another one, though. Shares of Best Buy, ticker symbol BB. Why? They are <laughs> moving here on the day by uh, about 2% lower, actually, 2% down here early in trade. That's following a downgrade to underperform from Bank of America, with one analyst noting that recession fears in 2023 threatened to damper on Best Buy's positive earnings growth there. Um, they also said that we believe it's in a strong position in core products, should have opportunities to expand into new categories going forward, although a midterm pullback on discretionary retail categories presents a headwind to both sales growth and valuation. I mean, it's interesting because we're talking about effectively the same thing for two very different sectors. In other words, home builders obviously are, you know, have already been hurt by a housing pullback and probably going to continue to do so. But the Barclays analysts are saying now is a good time to get in. Best Buy, kind of in the same boat, right? Mm. People are pulling back on electronic spending and probably will continue to do so. But in this case, the valuation is not low enough for the analysts there to get interested. Yeah, I want to go easy on Best Buy today. I'm just not in the mood to get an email from them uh, today. It's been, a long, it's been a long week and it's only Wednesday. So I will say this. We've been very critical of Best Buy the past six months. Not operationally. This is a, a well-run uh, company. It's just the economic environment has led to, uh, I would say, too much inventory in the stores. Discounting has picked up. You walk into a Best Buy store this holiday season, I, I would argue the traffic has been weak during key periods. Also, the discounts and the deflation in a lot of categories, notably big screen TVs and other parts of that store, have been high 
ultimately calling into question how do those margins look for the fourth quarter? Probably not too great. It's good enough for me to get a new TV. <laughs> the promotions are plentiful right now. The larger question for Best Buy, even if you go into next year, and f clearly for some of the analysts that are looking out into next year and even beyond, there is some marriage between the number of people that are, are looking at either refurbishing or kind of updating some of the hardware, the appliances within their homes, and even some of that home technology, uh, and what that cycle looks for looks like for a company in Best Buy and for anybody who already pulled that forward when they were spending more time at home perhaps that pushes it out even further at this point and so I think for the number of people that are looking at the promotions and the deals right now and they're saying you know what I don't really need that particular TV I don't need a new refrigerator that Best Buy might have then I'm, I'm good the deals mean nothing to me did you get any Sonos speakers no Sonos speakers I didn't get a Sonos speaker I'm, I'm Samsung all, all the way on the speaker front okay well Unless it's headphones, Bose. So, interesting. Audio file me. All right, well, that's good for you guys to know at home. Coming up, Microsoft <laughs> is calling out regulators for ignoring its offer to make Call of Duty available to its rivals in its purchase of Activision Blizzard. We've got the details and much more introspective thoughts of ourselves. Thanks. <laughs>turn it over to the gaming space. Microsoft now saying regulators ignored its offer to make Call of Duty available to rivals as part of its purchase of Activision Blizzard. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley has the details on this drama. Dan, what do we know? This is, this is big drama, high drama in the video game world. Basically what's going on here is Microsoft wants to buy Activision Blizzard for $69 billion. It would be Microsoft's largest acquisition to date. Uh, the gaming side of their company doesn't make up that much revenue, so uh, you have to figure they're going to be uh, trying to push that very heavily. The reason why they seemingly want Activision Blizzard uh, is twofold. One, because of the game Call of Duty. Uh, Activision Blizzard also has other games. They have World of Warcraft, Diablo, big name titles like that. But Call of Duty is the only one that made a billion dollars in 10 days. So that's why it's so important. The second reason is because they're trying to build out their gaming subscription service, Game Pass. Uh, they have a cloud uh, element to that. Microsoft obviously has huge uh, capabilities with its Azure cloud. Uh, and so they already have the technology to go and allow people to play games on uh, any device 
The key here is mobile devices. Mobile gaming uh, is obviously the fastest growing uh, as far as revenue and players. People around the world generally don't have game consoles. They have smartphones. If you can get them to play Microsoft games via the cloud on their smartphones, boy, you got a really captive audience right there. Outside of that, Activision Blizzard has King, which makes Candy Crush. So it would really allow them to reach a huge number of gamers around the world that are just untapped. They said that they uh, wanted to go forward with uh, giving PlayStation Sony uh, 10 years of guarantee to have the next Call of Duty. Uh, right now, those are yearly releases. We don't know if they would continue to allow it yearly releases. Uh, the thing that I think was uh, kind of standing out was would they have allowed it to be on Sony's rival cloud network? And they said they would. So it really comes down to, you know, does the FTC think that this would damage competition? Microsoft says, look, they outsell us like crazy. It's not even fair. They have better, they specifically said that Sony blows away their own in-house games. So their, their own developed games, they're basically just dumping on and saying, Sony's way better than us, man. It's, you know, just give us Call of Duty, you know, give yeah. us Activision Blizzard. So, you know, I, it, it'll be interesting to see how this goes forward, but it's not just the FTC, it's the EU and the UK that this also has to get through. And, you know, they are already doing uh, the, the second tier investigations that they have to. So what's the likelihood at this point? And what, like, is there anything else that Microsoft might be asked to do to satisfy the regulators? I mean, you know, in like a weird kind of way, they said that they would uh, allow uh, or give uh, Call of Duty to Nintendo as well, which Nintendo doesn't play in that space, mm. really. Um, their console, the Switch, just can't do it. Um, they're also not in cloud gaming at all. They're, they're still testing it, which is wild. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the, the big deal here is what impact exclusivity would have. So the, the, the key here is, would they keep Activision Blizzard games only on Microsoft products after this 10 year uh, period goes? And that's a big deal because the idea would be then, okay, I wanna play Call of Duty with my friends. They need to have an Xbox or be subscribed to Xbox Game Pass. So I'm just gonna sign up for Game Pass and not sign up for PlayStation. The reality of someone doing that though, the average gamer, mm. I mean, it's hard to, to see that happening. Sony just does such great work with their games. They have so many big name games that people want access to that I, I, I just can't see people saying, I'm gonna ditch Sony entirely. There's a reason why they outsell Xbox because their, their first party titles are so good. That said, Microsoft also did recently buy uh, ZeniMax. Uh, they make uh, Bethesda games. Mm. So things like uh, the Elder Scrolls franchise, Fallout, big name titles that people really want. So now Microsoft has those two, it's starting to look more and more formidable. Mm. A resident gamer, Dan Halley, thanks so much. Mm. Not many economists are talking about it, believe it or not, but maybe they should be. That is, of course, the plunge in gas prices this holiday shopping season. A lot of regular gas prices in the United States have moved lower to $3.25 a gallon, which is 35% uh, below the mid-June all-time high. Gas prices are now seven cents below year-ago levels. There I am, shopping for my own gas. All right, all eyes on Fed Chief Jerome Powell this afternoon as he shares his latest thinking on rates in the economy. So what's your action plan? Our next guest has one for you, so don't go anywhere.
The enthusiasm after yesterday's consumer price index print uh, didn't last long. Uh, we saw stocks come off of their highs later in the day, and the perception is still that the Fed is going to stay the course, at least for now. Let's talk more about what to expect from the Fed today and beyond and what it means for stocks with Vic, uh, Veronica Willis, Wells Fargo Investment Strategy uh, Institute analyst. Good to see you. So um, as we are looking at... Um, what we might hear from the Fed today. What clues are you looking for as to the future direction? I think what we're going to look really closely at is what does Chairman Powell say about the future course of Fed monetary policy? We're expecting that he's going to maintain that the Fed is committed to getting inflation back toward the 2% target. And even though we got a um, a softer inflation report than what was expected yesterday, we're still far away from that 2% target. And so we think that Powell is going to you know, remain committed to that messaging that they want to get inflation down back to that target. And so does that also mean that even if we do see a pause in 2023 at some point, that we could still see, even after that pause, incremental hikes, depending upon what the course of inflation does look like? Yeah, I think it's really dependent also on what happens with the economy in 2023. We are expecting an economic slowdown. And with that slowdown, we're expecting inflation to also come down. And so if inflation comes down like we expect during an economic slowdown, after a Fed pause, they may not need to resume raising any rates after. Do you have any big or are you and your team have any big contrarian calls investors need to be on the lookout for? I think right now we are still recommending a you know defensive positioning, preparing for an economic slowdown, um, really being cautious with inequities shifting away from things like small cap into large and mid cap stocks where they can weather kind of an economic slowdown a little bit better, still favoring the U.S. over international. But I think, you know, within fixed income, we don't want to abandon that altogether. It's been a really tough year for fixed income investors. But we think right now is a good time for those investors seeking income to lock in these higher yields as we start to approach peak yield. So how many months do you believe the Fed will be looking at to, to really constitute a trend that we're moving in the right direction? Or how many readings, I should say? I think we're, they probably want to see sustainability for a few months in various different measures of inflation. We've seen CPI coming down pretty consistently for a few months, but last week we just got a hotter than expected PPI report. And so um, the Fed is looking at all of these different reports for inflation. They're looking at CPI, they're looking at the um, personal consumption and um, expenditures. They're looking at PPI as well for all of the trends, for all of the different ways that inflation kind of feeds into the economy. And so I think they're looking for all of those measures of inflation to start trending lower over a course of few months. And we'll see if it happens. We're all crossing our fingers too for various <laughs> reasons. Veronica, good to see Veronica Willis of the Wells Fargo Investment Institute. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, Saz is taking a closer look at valuation metrics for Tesla. He shares his take next.
Tesla shares, they're down over 50% this year. The slide is starting to catch the eye of valuation watchers, including our very own Brian Slavsky. <laughs> I didn't know you were a valuation watcher. I'm a former analyst. This is what I do in my spare time. I try to keep those valuation chops humming. I will not forget all the stuff that I learned over 15 years. But nonetheless, I, I did a deep dive into Tesla's uh, valuations. And uh, our, our friend of the show, Dan I, is pointing out to me, this is... Uh, Tesla stock is now at valued at some of the cheapest levels he, have, he has ever seen, at least looking back over the past five years. Let me take through a couple numbers here you see in that screen. Tesla stock is trading at a 70% discount to its historical average forward price to earnings multiple. That is just absolutely eye-popping. 63% discount to historical forward price to EBITDA multiple. And then lastly, a 59% discount to historical forward price to sales multiple. I know a lot of technical terms, but the bottom line is this. As Tesla stock, or as the company has lost almost about $280 billion in market cap uh, year to date, these valuation metrics have come down. This is the streets uh, or investors way of saying in real time, they are concerned about the future uh, operating profits and cash flows of a Tesla. Now, why are these concerns, in fact, rising on the company's cash output, let's say, looking out over the next five years? A couple very, very simple reasons here. First and foremost, Twitter. Of course, we had that Goldman Sachs, uh, that cautionary note out from them this morning, acknowledging that they see this Twitter situation with Musk as polarizing and as a risk to the stock. So check done with that one. Again, concerns on China manufacturing output. We have seen that in recent months weigh on uh, Tesla shares. And then rising competition. I think if you look back this year, uh, you will have seen this was the year GM, Ford, and a lot of other automakers, I would argue, finally start to caught up, catch up with Tesla in terms of uh, the electric vehicles they're making. Of course, I think it was this week, Ford won that Motor Trend uh, Auto of the Year award with the electric uh, F-150, which is very interesting. My take is this, though, uh, looking forward uh, into Tesla. Uh, your deep thought for today, folks, is Tesla stock really cheap. And, and, I, and I say that because, and there is our team. Glad we're catching a ride with I you. I think that's, Just yes, that's the, a Tesla. Out the sunroof. That's a Tesla. <laughs> now, the stock is still valued at a big premium to the broader market. Now, Tesla stock probably shouldn't trade at a significant discount to the broader market, but still, uh, with all these concerns uh, swirling, it is probably just better to wait to see how things shake out before you can ultimately say this stock is too cheap to ignore. It's interesting, especially trying to figure out how much investors have been looking through some of the production issues, looking through the Elon even headwind now that exists with Tesla and, and trying to figure out, all right, what does that mean for the ability to produce in the future and just the focus that Elon has on this company right now too? Yeah, you have to wonder if these distractions are playing out, when does it show up in Tesla's financial mm -hmm. statement? So something to keep an eye on. And of course, add this disclosure, this is not me picking any stocks. It's just providing a evaluation framework on how you should be thinking about it if you are interested in, in buying or selling Tesla shares. It's important to do this valuation homework. How do you, how do you factor in refusing to pay rent on I knew you were going to mention that. You're not going to let it go. <laughs> into your valuation well, models I'm not even Tesla. going to reply to you. Time to go to break. Coming up, we're going to do a deeper dive into the year for one top trending ticker after investors took a big bite out of tech in 2022. And Tesla is one of those trending tickers. However, we're not talking about that one next. Deep tease. Yeah.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brian Sazi here with Julie Hyman and Brad Smith. Markets, well, they're marking time ahead of the Fed rate decision this afternoon. Right now, we're seeing all major, uh, all three major indices in the green. Dow is up close to 150 points. Here's what's on tap this hour. Looking for a deal. The M&A market has shown some signs of life into year end. We'll get an M&A outlook from the folks over at RBC. And the road ahead for Apple. We'll dive into how next year may shape up for the tech giant. And we'll stick out with our 2023 vibes here and go inside the oil market to see if more price declines are coming soon. Brad, over to you. All right, inside of four hours until that key Fed decision here. And then we'll hear later on from Fed Chair Jay Powell in a press conference around 2.30. But taking a look at the Dow as of right now, just fractionally higher by about four tenths of a percent, 135 points in the green. Uh, year to date, we are still net lower. But of course, over these past two days, or at least this week, we'll put it on that scale. We are still holding on to some gains as well by about 2.3 percent. NASDAQ composite, tech heavy average. You're seeing that hold on to some gains as well. It's up by about four tenths of a percent. S&P 500, you're seeing that higher by about half a percent right now. Let's take a look at some of the biggest movers that we're seeing on the day. On the NASDAQ composite, you've got a big move in Microsoft. That's up by about one and a quarter percent as of right now. You've also got some significant movements as well that we're seeing in, oh wow, that's interesting, Atlassian up by about four percent, just shouting out some of the larger and outsized moves that we're seeing in Datadog, also up by about 3.3 percent. But to the downside, yeah, you've got Charter Communications down 13 and a half percent here early in trade and then just lastly checking in on some of the sector movement here we are continuing to see more gainers than decliners as of right now just communication services in the red that's down by about eight tenths of a percent or excuse me you've got three decliners now energy uh, you've also got health care or materials rather it seems like in negative territory and then communication services but we're being led by utilities here on the day so we'll continue to keep a close eye on that as we move forward throughout the rest of the day's session stocks going up and down love to see it all right congress reached a bipartisan framework for its omnibus spending bill to fund the U.S. government through September 2023, just days before a deadline that would have triggered a shutdown. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman is here with the details. Rick. Right. There's not going to be a government shutdown. Now, this is not a done deal yet, but uh, the Congress is going to fund the government. Looks like they're going to fund it all the way through the end of the fiscal year, which would be uh, through September 30th. Um, so that means we're not going to have to worry, uh, assuming this gets done, Important caveat, we're not going to have to worry about a government shutdown anytime during the next, uh, let's say, nine and a half months. Uh, so here's what is likely to be in that final bill, and here's likely not to be in that final bill. It probably will include uh, the $37 billion in additional uh, aid for Ukraine that President Biden wants, and also this um, thing called the Electoral uh, College Act, or the Electoral Count Act, I think it's called, um, which would take away the ability of, so, of state legislators to challenge federal elections, which is important for 2024. So we don't see a replay of 2020 uh, when Trump tried to challenge the election. But what is not in there? State, the Safe Banking Act looks like it may not end up in. That would help finance cannabis companies. Looks like it may not happen. We probably are not going to get a debt ceiling extension in there. So we may have to fight that battle next spring or next summer. Uh, and then there have been, there's been talk about some tax provisions, uh, perhaps a child tax credit in a, in a new business tax break look like they will not get in there. So doesn't mean that stuff won't happen in 2023, but that tells us what the agenda might be in Congress next year. And, and what do we think is sort of most relevant for markets or that investors need to pay attention to either in this bill or early 2023, what they should be zeroing in on? I think two things, no tax changes. Um, so there are not going to be any tax changes that affect uh, corporate profits, whether positively or negatively. And then um, this this debt ceiling problem. Uh, so the federal borrowing limit um, is going to have to be raised again. Uh, we, we know how this goes. Uh, Republicans sometimes think that it's good politics for them to threaten that they're not going to agree to extend the federal borrowing limit. And then we have this showdown that sometimes goes down to the last minute. Will the Treasury be able to pay its bills or not? The debt ceiling has always gotten extended before, um, and this has not really worked for Republicans, but they are going to control the House. So if they just want to cause trouble and muck things up, they're going to have the ability to do that next year. Rick, while we got you, even more news from Ron DeSantis in uh, one of the bills that we're tracking there. What's the latest? Uh, this is uh, not a bill. It's a, it's a survey. The Wall oh. Street Journal just did on uh, uh, Republican, uh, likely Republican primary voters. Uh, and DeSantis is polling way ahead of Donald Trump uh, if he chooses to run 
in 2024. Now, this they're trying to figure out who might get the Republican nomination, not necessarily who would win. Um, look, this this is all way premature. I find these polls, you know, more than a year ahead of the actual elections, kind of tedious and pointless. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's obviously a, a parlor game and uh, among people who uh, follow politics. So DeSantis, the Florida governor, clearly, I think, the front runner at this point. Um, Donald Trump's political future, it looks very grim. Um, he's the only announced candidate for the time being, um, but he is in a bad spot and his fortunes are probably going to get worse as his legal woes multiply and other things go wrong for him. So dis watch DeSantis. Indeed, we will. Yahoo Finance Senior mm -hmm. Columnist Rick Newman, thanks so much. Hi, guys. All right, before we head to break, Wells Fargo, well, they're keeping it real on FedEx into earnings on December 20th. Sales Wells Fargo's industrials team, even after substantial revisions, we believe EPS estimates have downside risk for FedEx, and we remain cautious with the shares. Investors will likely look through earnings this quarter, focusing on the implications for the fiscal third quarter, and this is problematic for the shares. Coming up, the U.S. looks to add over 30 Chinese companies to the trade blacklist. Julie is back with that, plus more of today's top headlines next. Now to some other headlines that we are watching this morning. Chinese leaders will indeed proceed with an important policy meeting in Beijing that's set to begin on Thursday, according to Bloomberg. The news outlet had previously reported that officials were weighing whether to postpone the Central Economic Work Conference because of a surge in COVID cases. The annual conference sets out economic goals for the coming year, and that's a bigger challenge now, with economists estimating China's growth has slowed to about 3% this year, far below the official target of around 5.5%, and marking one of China's worst performances in nearly half a century. China's current reopening happening much more rapidly than outside analysts had predicted. The country has also stopped providing broad data on new COVID cases after stopping mandatory testing. Meanwhile, Biden's chip war, President Biden's chip war with China is heating up with the U.S. Department of Commerce looking to put Chinese chip maker Yangtze Memory and more than 30 other companies on a trade blacklist. 
That would keep them from buying some American components. It's expected to happen as soon as this week. A spokesperson from China's foreign ministry said the U.S. has, quote, politicized and weaponized economic cooperation, noting the disruption to China's supply chains and that, quote, China would take steps to protect the rights of its companies. And Airbnb removed roughly 4,000 accounts from its app in 2022 for violating its non-discrimination policy, which it asks hosts to treat guests with respect without judgment or bias based on factors like race. These changes build on Airbnb's 2016 civil rights audit, where it looked into the racial profiling of guests after users circulated the hashtag Airbnb while black on Twitter to highlight what they perceived as racist experiences at Airbnb rentals. Brad? All right, thanks, Julie. It's been a tumultuous year for global commodities, and our next guest says investors should expect a last hurrah for oil after a possible recession in 2023 to 2024, with demand peaking somewhere between 2025 and 2029. That's a long time. Joining us now, we've got City Global Head of Commodities Research, Ed Morris. Okay, so Ed, help us drill down into, I guess pun fully intended, help us drill down into exactly what you're basing some of the expectation off of here, especially given the rise and the move higher that we've seen in oil and the energy sector over the course of this year. Sure, well, the rise in, uh, in prices in the last month or the last few weeks is just noise in the system. Prices are significantly lower by uh, a lot than they were in March. We had Brent pricing at $125 in March and uh, at 82 right now. So prices have come off a lot. Part of that is uh, short-term demand, uh, again, short-term supply. Prices have gone up a bit because of uh, uncertainties about how much Russian oil is going to be lost to the system uh, as a result of the new uh, price cap that the G7 and the EU have put on, and partly because of the embargo on seaborne crude that Europe implemented on the 5th of December. Uh, but your, your other question is a, is a longer term secular question. Normally, when you get out of a recession, you have a spike in oil demand. We think that we'll have a bit of a growth in oil demand with uh, coming out of recession after this year, but we think it's not going to be as robust as is normally the case. And that's because we're seeing a peaking of transport fuel demand at a much earlier stage than people had thought previously. Uh, even in China, which has been you know the mainstay, the main force of growth and demand for oil since 1990, actually, uh, we think that diesel demand already peaked. In China, we look at the rate of growth in the last three years of electric vehicle penetration. We look at Chinese policy on reducing further the internal combustion engine in vehicles by getting a domination of electric vehicles over those. And we're gonna see a drop in motor fuel demand in transportation, generally speaking. Yes, there's gonna be increased air travel, but um, these are based on engines that are significantly more efficient than anything on average in use in 2019 before the pandemic. And we're also seeing a very big move in the next five years uh, into, um, into sustainable fuels one way or another. So one of, one of the big uh, issues right now is conversion of refineries into making biofuels. Mm -hmm. Biofuels look like, smell like oil, but they don't come from oil. We actually expect some 5 million barrels to 6 million barrels a day of new biofuel use between now and 2030, that with the pressure to get off of, uh, uh, of oil in the transportation fuel market really does spell in our mind the end to oil as the dominant fuel in the world. Ed, what's your worst case scenario for oil prices next year? And, and with that worst case being the U.S. does enter a recession. Uh, so the, the worst case for oil prices is really a surge in production that uh, comes from a bunch of sources. Uh, and also sl slow down in, in production. We, we should be mindful that, uh, that there is spare production in the oil market. We should be mindful that the data on the U.S. are kind of funny. Um, the EIA published two different reports in the last week that are totally contradictory. One was the revisions upward on oil production in the United States, total liquids production in the United States. It reached the highest level ever. Uh, close to 19 million barrels a day for the combination of crude oil, natural gas liquids, and bio, biofuels. Um, it had an, uh, a crude oil production level of about, um, of about 12.3 million barrels a day, which is significantly higher than the weekly numbers for now. 
and they're predicting a number for next year that's lower than that. Uh, so their revisions have not been taken into account in their forecasts. Uh, and we expect that the U.S. is going to be growing by a good 4 million barrels a day of crude and 4 million barrels a day of natural gas liquid. So uh, we, we think that the growth in supply uh, might provoke the OPEC countries, OPEC plus countries to say, hey, we tried and we failed to uh, put a floor under prices. The only way out is to monetize our resources and to uh, and to fight, you know, the U.S. and Canada and Brazil again uh, by upping production and uh, and and lowering the price. So there are a whole bunch of factors that can go into a low price that would be in the low sixty dollar range. I, I mean, that makes it sound like any uptick in demand ed next year is more than is going to be more than absorbed by that ample supply that you're talking about. I mean, is that a worst case or is that that more sounds like a base case? No, it's not our base case okay. yet. Uh, our base case, by the way, is that oil demand growth next year is going to be around 1.2 or 1.3 million barrels a day. And our base case is that supply will be growing by twice that amount over the course of the next year. A good bit of that coming from the Western Hemisphere, from the US, Brazil, Canada, Guyana, Argentina, maybe Venezuela, and, and even Mexico. Uh, but our, our base case is that uh, the efforts to put a floor under prices by uh, by OPEC is uh, is a tough one when we have a slowdown in demand growth and more than ample production coming out. Ed, from what you've seen in ED or excuse me EV adoption to this point, where does that begin to factor into some of your outlook, especially looking into 2025 and even out through 2029? Well, it looks pretty important. We look as, as though the EV penetration is at that accelerating point of an S-curve where you start low, flattish, and then you zoom up. And we think that zooming up is going to continue uh, so that we get to the point that by uh, 2029, uh, at the current rate of that S-curve from what we see in Europe and uh, China in particular, but also in the U.S., we'll get to the point of uh, a point of no return, actually, for gasoline demand. Ed Morse, City Global Head of Commodities Research. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate it, Ed. Thanks for having me again. Thanks, Certainly. Care. Guys, coming up, we're going to do a deeper dive into Apple's performance in 2022. That's next.
quick check on some of the trending tickers for you from yahoofinance.com. We start with Delta Airlines, which, which we talked about the company updating its forecast, raising it, and the shares are up about 3% on the day. I'm also watching a lot of the various um, companies in the auto space, quantum space, getting um, a negative call out from Goldman Sachs, this maker of sort of next generation uh, batteries, down about 5.5%. Lucid, by the way, is down about 3% today. And Tesla's slide continues. It's off by 1.5%. Charter Communications also coming out with a forecast that is causing a sell-off in that stock. It's down by 12%. So that one catching my eye as well. And going over to some of the heat maps that we are watching, Brad was taking a look at some of the groups earlier. I want to look at the NASDAQ 100 as well. Most Mostly green on the day, as we've been talking about, a lot of these big tap pack. Big cap tech investors are anticipating what the Fed's going to be saying this afternoon, what Jay Powell will be saying. Most of them holding up pretty well. Tesla remains a notable exception to that. Uh, but by and large, we're seeing green here. It looks like Comcast may be getting hit along with Charter this morning. We'll be right back. actually seen some deals announced this week. Biotech firm Amgen buying Horizon, PE firm BDT Capital Partners taking grill maker Weber Private, and software maker Coupa bought by Tom Bravo. That one's been speculated upon for a bit. But the flurry of deals may not herald a shift in appetite. For more on their outlook on mergers and acquisitions heading into the new year, we have Vito Sperduto, RBC Capital Markets, co-head of Global Mergers and Acquisitions. And whew, it has been quite a year, hasn't it, Vito? So, yes. <laughs> um, are things shifting at all? I mean, that's just anecdotal, right, that we've had yeah. a couple de deals this week, but still. No, I, and I think when we'll talk about it, I think these transactions highlight some of the trends we're seeing and mm -hmm. some of what we're looking forward to in the coming year. Um, I mean, it's certainly been a tale of two halves if you look at the first two quarters of the year versus the second half of the year. Um, I mean, keep in mind the volumes we've seen the last two quarters on a quarterly basis is lower than we typically see, and we, you'd have to go back well below, well before the pandemic to see these types of volumes. So we're going to end up the year at about um, probably 1.6 trillion in the U.S., which is well down from last year, off about 43 percent. 
Um, but if you put it in perspective, it's only off about 10% where the pre-pandemic levels were. And you saw in 21, when the market just was exceeding expectation, it was primarily driven by the fact that there was so much pent up demand. And you had, when the market reopened, you had everybody accessing the market. So if I look into 23 right now, certainly the first quarter is gonna be challenged. Um, I think all of us are looking forward to the news later today and try to see the tone that's gonna be put out there by the Fed. Um, but until there's a, some stabilization there, mm -hmm. it's gonna be difficult to get a regular trend going. Um, I do think the second half of next year is gonna be extremely strong, primarily because we're going to see a lot of deals that people are planning to bring out. And so if I look at our own pipeline right now, um, it, there is a significant amount of volume that's expected in the second half of next year. But you know, as we look at our team, our team is working as hard as they ever have because there's many clients preparing to hit the window when it opens. And so if I look at next year, uh, I certainly think it'll be at least in line with what we saw on average pre-pandemic and likely higher because you're gonna see some deals that didn't happen now flow into next year. I think a lot of folks are waiting for a series of big deals in the tech space, notably in software. Some of these uh, valuations have been absolutely hammered this year. Is that yeah. one sector that investors should look to that will see a big pickup next year? Uh, it, tech is always leading the way from a M&A volume perspective. If you look at the LBOs that have happened this year, I think like um, a little over 35% of them have been software and tech focused. Um, I think the deal that you just mentioned earlier in terms of Toma buying Coupa is a great highlight of what you see in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Certainly a darling early in the pandemic and was trading at levels well above where, where it is now. Um, at the start of the year, it was almost double what the deal price is today. Uh, and it got beaten down during the year. And you see someone like Toma who just raised and closed on three funds totaling over $32 billion in new fresh capital, uh, executing on a significant transactions. Now, if you dig in though, part of what you're seeing is that they're finding different ways to get the deal done. So versus the traditional bank financing you'd see for the debt, they went to direct lenders. So 19 parties provided 2.6 billion worth of capital. That's pretty significant. Um, they did 3 billion through direct lending when they uh, bought Anaplan earlier in the year. Um, and so that marketplace has taken, um, taken prominence while the traditional financing sources aren't really available with the volatile environment. Now, I do expect it to go back. I mean, if, if you look back at the, the, the start of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you saw the private equity firms doing a lot of uh, pipes in the public companies, and they were doing alternative deals. As soon as the market came back and they could do traditional LBOs, they went right back to that. Right. And so there's too much capital to spend not to go back to that market once it reopens, which I think second half of the year feel of next year feels like it's going to be a good time period. Less of an easy money environment. Deals for some of the acquisitions that, that publicly, publicly traded companies are making, they're going to be scrutinized more because the yeah. investors are going to be looking across how much of that money is going out the door and what growth or what accretiveness some of those deals carry sure. as well. And so what role will the financing of these deals also play in 2023? Yeah, I think if you're, you know, Brad, if you're referring to sort of what public companies are doing, sure. um, I think if you look at someone like an Amgen and Horizon, mm -hmm. um, it highlights the fact that you have a party with significant amount of capital on their balance sheet. I think they have over $11 billion of cash on their balance sheet. Now, obviously, some of that sits in foreign jurisdictions and it's hard to access, but they're also an investment grade borrower mm -hmm. and they're also a, a leader in their sector. And so parties are gonna look at that and that, those are the parties that are gonna do well now in a volatile environment. They're able to do deals. Um, we often track cash on balance sheets and we look at the S&P 500 as an indicator. Pretty interesting, if you go back to the 0809 credit crisis, the S&P 500 had about a trillion dollars of cash on their balance sheets. It peaked at about 2.1 trillion mm -hmm. uh, at the end of 21, right now it's at 1.9. So it's almost double the amount it was before. And I think CEOs have tended to be more conservative. They've wanted to be more liquid. Um, they don't want to get caught again like they did in 08, 09. Um, and if you look at the sectors where have the largest cash piles, tech and healthcare. If you look at the sectors that are the most active from an M&A perspective, tech and healthcare. 
And so it just works in that fashion. And I think we're going to see a fair bit more from a technology consolidation perspective, but then also biotech uh, is a hot sector. I mean, Amgen's buying um, access to a certain number of products that they, they, they covet. Yeah. Vito Sperduto, RBC Capital Markets, co-head of Global Mergers and Acquisitions. A lot to track coming into next year. Thanks for teeing this up for us. We've got a lot to keep our eye on. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're going to do a deeper dive into the year for Apple on the other side of this short break. Shares lower by about 17% over the course of 2022 thus far. We're taking a look back at some of our top trending tickers in 2022, and today's focus is Apple. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery joins us to break down the details. Jared. That's right. Uh, this list of top 10 tickers here, these are the most viewed by you. By the way, Apple sitting at number five has had about 250 million clicks on our quote page year to date. So thank you for that. But let's take a look now inside Apple stock. And this is going to be a year to date chart since the beginning of the year. And I've annotated it su such that we see some of the significant price and milestones. This isn't going to be about fundamentals. We'll talk about that with an analyst uh, upcoming here. But on the very first day of the year, and this is pretty unusual, Apple settled to add it's high for their year, which was also a record high, $182 and change, uh, market cap sitting just si shy of $3 trillion. By the way, the very next day on an intraday basis, Apple's uh, market cap would reach $3 trillion, but it would never close at that level. I remember this because we were preparing a number of graphics, which we really didn't use much of early on in the year. So uh, then here's another milestone. In the middle of May, Saudi Aramco surpassed Apple's the world's most valuable company, Aramco sitting at $2.43 million over in Saudi Arabia, Apple at 2.37 million. And then here was the low of the year. Apple was down 26.8% uh, at that point in the middle of June. Uh, market cap sitting at 2.105 trillion. Notably, the market cap never dipped below $2 trillion the entire year. 
After that, we saw a sizable rally, so sizable, in fact, that we came within 4% from that record high. And that was when many other stocks, including many other mega caps, were far, far uh, down on the list there. Market cap of $2.805 trillion at that point. Now, here is another milestone. Uh, Apple rallies to number two on Yahoo Finance's top trending ticker list. That's on a rolling one-week basis. This is the highest spot of the year, and this also came after the 22 product launch, 2022 product launch, which includes the iPhone 14. By the way, the very next week, one of those days, Apple and Microsoft would have their worst days uh, since I think 2020, so pretty sizable drop after that announcement. And now here is where we are right now. Apple is sitting at number five on Yahoo Finance's top trending ticker list. And just by some uh, historical uh, examples here, by way of historical uh, tendencies, Apple has been towards the top of our trending ticker list since I've been following this way back when I first started here, 2015, 2016, guys. Yeah, I mean, Apple is a perennial favorite. It's probably the most widely held stock, I think. No um, longer GE. I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah, I mean, Apple's definitely got to be up there, but it looks like it's having the worst year since 2008 as I yeah. eyeball some of the returns. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And let's go do a deeper dive now into the state of Apple from a fundamental basis. We're joined by Technalysis Research President and Chief Analyst Bob O'Donnell. Bob, it's good to see you. So... There have been some, I mean, obviously Apple has been partially a victim of higher interest rates, the perception around that, but there's also been real concerns about demand going into recession, about the, you know, sort of rocky closure and reopenings in China. What's your sort of 100,000 foot take here on what's been going on at Apple? Well, you know, there's a number of interesting things going on here, Julie. I mean, it, you know, you've got, first of all, the fact that as we've seen around the world, purchasing by consumers of devices that exploded during the pandemic really kind of slowed down quite a bit late summer, early fall. And of course, Apple uh, was a big part of that. Smartphone sales are down for the year. Uh, PC sales after exploding and, and Apple getting a big share of that have gone way down. And then on top of that, you had the challenges, the manufacturing challenges that you hinted at in China, where the one phone that was selling particularly well was the iPhone uh, the 14 Max. Uh, and the Max Pro, and those were the phones that were most impacted by the that factory uh, challenges, you know, in uh, with COVID in China. So it was a really kind of a double whammy for Apple on the iPhone 14. You know, and, and the other problem that we're seeing, I think, with tech in general is, you know, we've really got to this mature phase where, to be honest with you, a lot of things have gotten a little boring. I hate to say it, but, you know, I think hopefully in 23, that turns out to be a good thing because we see a, a rationalization of where things are, including Apple, and then a more modest sense of growth. And even from a product side, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this, you know, there were stories last week about Apple, you know, the car not going to be quite as advanced as everybody thought. It's going to be more like, well, yeah, it's a, an electric car with some assisted driving, but it's got a wheel and pedals and, and the headset that they're planning to do, um, perhaps next year, perhaps in 24, is going to be more along the lines of what Meta already has. So that's not quite as revolutionary. So I don't know. There's this interesting sense of, uh, you know, they haven't really had major innovations for a long time. They've executed incredibly well on the products and services that they've had. But then, you know, there's always been that what's next question. And that keeps getting pushed a little bit further out. And I think that's impacting the stock as well. Can, can that rationalization or normalization in tech that we're seeing at the same time of this trend of a more value conscious consumer, can that initiate even the next big super cycle that Apple has come to depend on over the previous several years at this point? Well, it's a great question, Brad. And I, you know, I'm not positive it can, just to be honest with you, because uh, you know, look, iPhones, everybody's like, you can't tell the 12 from the 13 from the 14 anymore. And people know that, and they're holding onto their phones longer. Uh, again, Apple got a nice bump from the M series Max and, and they've grown quite nicely and they're getting into enterprise now, which is, is relatively new for them to be a big player in enterprise. But at the same time, it's, you know, these things are, are devices people are recognizing, hey, I can hold on to this longer. If times are tight, there are other things I can do. The one savior, of course, has been the services business for Apple. And that has come, you know, become this enormous a growth engine for them. And I think that will continue because people have become accustomed to using a lot of the services. Of course, obviously streaming, there's a lot of competition. Let's not kid ourselves. But still, Apple's been able to do a lot better than I think people expected versus big players like uh, Netflix and, um, and others. Um, and the music business continues to do well. 
iCloud and other services are all part of this. And, you know, I, I still think there's opportunity there. That's where that modest, continuous growth can, has been for Apple has been in services, not so much on the hardware side. But Bob, is, is next year going to be the year that Apple needs to, I would argue, go back to being Apple with that game changing product? Do you think they have that in the pipeline and is next year uh, the year hits it? Well, you know, so I, I, that's, of course, what everybody's hoping for, and that's what this headset's going to be, because the car, uh, whatever happens with an Apple car, is going to be 25, 26, likely. So 23 is the year, theoretically, of this headset. Um, and the concern is, you know, rumors are saying this is going to be maybe a $2,000, $3,000 headset, which immediately makes it a very niche product. And it's not that AR vision where you can see, you know, it's going to be like more of a goggles kind of a, a format, which... Again, I don't know if that's really a mainstream product. There will be people who will be interested in it. They will absolutely upset that marketplace whenever, as they always do when they enter a market. But I'm not sure it's that mainstream blowout. And exactly to your point, that's of that Apple being Apple and just kind of knocking everybody's socks off. So we'll see. That is, in fact, the biggest question mark for 2023. All right, we'll leave it there. Technologist Research President Bob O'Donnell, always good to see you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. All right, this is the uh, day two of the crypto hearing on the collapse of FTX, this time in front of the Senate Banking Committee. We just heard from committee chair Senator Sherrod Brown a moment ago. Take a listen. FTX and Alameda Research took advantage of the crypto industry's appetite for speculation. They were able to borrow and lend from other platforms and invest in other crypto firms, inflating the crypto ecosystem and growing their own profits. Even this summer, as crypto values crashed and platforms began to fail, FTX and Alameda found ways to benefit. Joining us uh, for more analysis is Greg Valliere, AGF Investments Chief U.S. Policy Strategist. Greg, uh, Greg, always good to see you. Just wanted to get your uh, observations uh, from, the, from this testimony so far. Well, it's been a disastrous week. It's been a disastrous last couple of months uh, for the industry as a whole. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think what comes next is a very careful scrutiny of who they gave money to. From all indications, um, the, the firm gave uh, millions and millions to members of Congress. So this story has got a long shelf life. I think we're going to have a lot of hearings over the next few months. Hearings, and then what action do you believe comes from those hearings? Hard to say. We'll see what Gary Gensler comes up with. I think there's a lot of pressure on him to show that the government can be tough. But I, I think that the, the hearings will pretty much uh, illustrate the fact that th there was lax regulation. It seems like every decade we have something like this, Madoff or Alan Stanford, something like that. But this is going to be something I think that will really sour this industry, this market for quite some time. Uh, and so, and that's part of what we're hearing from the hearing as well, is that some of the folks who were there are talking about that they they do think that some of these abuses are even endemic um, in the industry. Um, the question is, I guess, ultimately, what do they do about it? Because like many things yep. in Washington, they talk about it for a long time, sometimes years. Sometimes they do something about it. Sometimes they don't. Very good point, Julie. I, I agree. Sometimes it's just hot air. But I, I, I would say that this time uh, you have to think that uh, customers, consumers w would realize how, how risky this investment is. And I think that alone will probably cast a pall over the entire crypto industry. Beyond that, I think that a lot of people are going to go to jail. And what I'm hearing from my friends in Washington is that, but some of the people, maybe not uh, uh, the head of the company, but could some of his uh, colleagues wind up flipping, going to uh, testify against the firm in order to avoid a lengthy jail sentence. That's not out of the question. We're seeing Kevin O'Leary on screen, of course, one of the famed FTX investors and one of many profiles who promoted FTX along the way as well. We had already seen the SEC crack down on the promotion of ICOs back in 2017. Should that be the same case, do you believe, in the, the crypto landscape? Because we had seen so many athletes, prominent profiles that were promoting FTX as well. Do you think similar, something similar will pass through? Hard to say. I think we're still at the early stages of the FTX scandal. Uh, there could be athletes involved. But again, I, I think there are many people on Capitol Hill, members of, the, of Congress, 
who are going to be held accountable for all the money they took. Uh, yesterday, it was quite a sight to see Joe Manchin, all these members of the Senate saying, we're returning the contributions. We're going to co contribute to uh, our favorite charity. I mean, everyone in this town is scrambling uh, to uh, weasel out of any kind of culpability, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. I think there's going to be a, a real scrutiny on who took all this money. And, and does it do anything for that um, thinking going forward? I mean, obviously, you know, <clears throat> campaign finance policy is what it is in the U.S., but um, do you yep. think that there's any chance that members of Congress are going to be more careful going forward? Probably not. I think that, you know, there are lessons to be learned here, obviously, from consumers. But when you talk about getting new legislation, new regulation, that often can hit a brick wall. And I think it's like after a mass shooting. You know, for 48 hours, everyone says we're going to have gun control, but then it fades as an issue. So I have my doubts as to whether anything can get enacted. But again, I think there'll be a lot of focus on members of Congress who've taken this money. SBF is the person that everyone can point at to blame right now, but there's still more largely within crypto uh, a space that is looking for answers and looking for some s solidifying results as well as to how it can operate and protect the general public, people who are actually believing in the underlying technology. Do you believe that Congress actually has a firm handle on that? No, I don't. I don't think they do. I don't think they understand the uh, complexity of the industry. Uh, so, no, I think it's going to be a long educational uh, process. I think for the industry, in order for them to get back on their feet, uh, they're going to ha they have a mammoth public relations effort, obviously. They're going to have to convince the public that th these are safe investments. I think they're going to encounter a very skeptical audience. Yes, most definitely so. And, and sort of on that front as well, Greg, you know, again, sort of going back to whether Congress takes action, I think of sort of public skepticism of Congress's understanding of crypto or for that matter, let's broaden it out and say social media companies. Do you think that Congress needs to do a better job? A admittedly, this is in some cases tough stuff to understand from a technology perspective. Um, can they do a better job? How do they do a better job of getting their arms around it? You don't know for sure if the pendulum is really shifting now. I think it is. I think there's going to be a lot more skepticism, a lot more uh, demands for uh, transparency. I, I think that's all coming. But as I said a few minutes ago, in terms of any kind of really tough uh, legislation, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Okay. AGF Investments Chief U.S. Policy Strategist Greg Valer. thanks. Appreciate the time. So long. Already. Guys, coming up, a royal welcome. Uh, we're going to discuss the record breaking. Oh, so Megan cute. On Netflix. Love it. So cute.
Welcome back. It's time for Cut for Time. Three stories, one minute each. Let's start with this. Netflix's new documentary about Prince Harry and Meghan has raked in over 81 million hours watched, making it the most watched documentary debut in its first week on the streaming platform ever. Saz, did you watch this? I've watched it. I I'm it. part of these hours. I love it. This is a true... Uh, just a love story, and I, it was just great to see how this played out. They traveled the world for each other, and, you know, I'm, I'm not being glib about it. I, I just find it very interesting to watch. I can't wait for the next drop. I will be there watching it probably with a pizza. One of our producers um, surmised that perhaps people are hate-watching it. It has gotten <laughs> terrible reviews, mm. aside from your size. It is not, uh, I don't know, it's people nice to see are a pre-Christmas love story. I mean, good for them. They fought the Oz bread. So fought some, fought something, yes. I mean, look, yeah, there was a lot that they had to go up against within the inner workings of the royal family, and I'm not going to act like I'm any expert on the royal family because <laughs> I'm not, and I don't track them. You're the and chief, actually, uh, you're the chief uh, Delta Force. I don't, want, yeah. I don't mm. want to be. Yeah, and so well, with that in mind, this is not something that's at the top of my watch list I, right I've now. I've been watching Wednesday, which is also scoring Wednesday's high. Great. Wednesday's I great. just finished it last night. No spoilers. Ooh, fair enough. All right, Meta is taking on Be Real with its latest feature. Instagram is officially testing Candid in South Africa, which will send users notifications to take pictures for their stories using both the front and back camera unfultered. I just, the innovation. That's what Be Real does. Yeah, the innovation. They're ripping it off. They're, they're I don't have Be Real. I'm the, not Be Real either. I'm not 15. The innovation just continues that these social media companies good for them. When I was at the U.S. Open over the summer, I did see people be reeling each other in like the row behind me, and I was just like, Is that okay. how you say it? Be reeling? I just be real to somebody. I be real somebody. I mean, again, <laughs> I, I, just the same way. I don't, way know, I, I don't know. David <laughs> Buster's. I can't. I can't. I can't get it. I can't get in David Buster's. Like you. We can't go to David Buster's anymore. They're no. not marketing directly to us. We may go, Brian Sazi. They're ju we're just not their target marketing we'll be demo real there. I'll be real longer. You. I am definitely not the target demo for this, but this is what Instagram does, right? This is what Facebook does. This is what Instagram yeah. does. They rip off other stuff that is more successful, and it sometimes it goes well, so sometimes it doesn't. I mean, Reels, you could argue, which they copied from TikTok. Stories is copied is from okay. Snapchat. Right, exactly. Yeah. And stories caught on. Yes. Reels, maybe less so. I don't know. Elon Musk has been kicked off his pedestal as the richest person alive, replaced by LVMH chairman and CEO Bernard Arnault after shares of Tesla have been cut in half this year. That's something we've been talking about, due in part, of course, as we've also been talking about Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Fun fact, Bernard Arnault, not on Twitter. Hmm. Not on Twitter. I don't know if any of these other guys. He's old, he's old, he's old school rich. He doesn't need to be on Twitter. He doesn't need it. No, that's old money right there. certainly does not. No, it's old money, but also LVMH has, has yeah. grown enormously oh, okay. oh, yeah. under his leadership and has a lot of, you know, LVMH is thought of as a luxury company, and it is, but they have a lot of other brands as well, and they've been doing pretty well. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for all those people in there. I hope they continue to see a just fabulous wealth. I know it's been a tough year with the, for the markets. I know times get tough for those folks. LVMH also benefiting from a more affluent consumer that perhaps has a little bit more of the discretionary <laughs> funds to throw around, even if that starts to bleed into their own sentiment around the economy. Right Saz now. is trying to make a joke and you're bringing it back to... Uh... <laughs> trying, I don't know, trying to be business class Brad over here. Just trying to stay oh, I'm going to be real you. I'm going to be real you. Be real, man. Be real. Yes. Good luck finding me. <laughs> <laughs> we be real each other every day, all day long, I guess. Let's take a quick check on the markets before we leave you, all right? And we set up for the Fed this afternoon. All three major averages up about a half a percent as people await what they're going to hear from j -Pal. I've also been keeping an eye on oil prices, you guys. We just talked to Ed Morse earlier, who's not terribly optimistic about the direction of oil prices next year. We just got our weekly report from the Energy Information Administration that showed um, a big build in inventories of more than 10 million barrels, much bigger than estimated. We saw oil come down a little bit off the highs from that, but not by very I'm much. I'm going to be real uh, Yahoo Finance oil chart. I'm going to put it on uh, online somewhere. I, I don't yeah. even know. Is that a thing? Probably not. Well, it would get caught in one of the cameras if yeah. you were taking a selfie and then on the other camera. Like, so are you, you super imposed? I just don't I'm not even on the platform. I have no idea. No idea. I feel like such a boomer right now. No, no idea. Coming up, Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Kufa are going to speak with one legal expert on the legal battle ahead for Sam Bankman Freed. I wonder if SBF was a B realer. Yeah, I think he was a little bit of everything. Maybe he has been crazy. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right, we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast and 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo along with Akiko Fujita. And here's a look at what we're watching today. Words matter. The Fed all but certain to hike rates by 50 basis points in about three hours' time. But once again, it's Jay Powell's language and tone in the spotlight. Will a dovish sounding chair push Bitcoin back towards 20,000? We'll have to see. And crypto goes to Washington. A Senate committee picks up where the House left off, grilling the likes of FTX spokesman and investor Kevin O'Leary as the fallout continues. We'll ask what governments and regulators hope to achieve. And grand opening or grand closing? China's reversal of zero COVID sees half-empty streets in Beijing. Is this a natural reaction to spiking cases after years of lockdowns? We'll discuss. But first, let's see how the major indices are trading ahead of today's Fed decision. You see all three major indices off their session highs, but still in cautiously positive territory right now. We see the Dow up more than 200 points, the S&P 500 up about 24 points. And a similar situation we're seeing with the Nasdaq, tech-heavy Nasdaq there, up about six-tenths of a percent. Let's also check in on the Treasury market, which does tend to move when we have one of these Fed announcement days. We're seeing for the 5, the 10 and the 30, both relatively flat, but in negative territory, we see that the five year down about 1% on the day, the 10 year down about half a percent. Well, Rochelle, let's dive right into what we're watching today. You highlighted those two, and we're going to start with the Fed. Of course, that decision coming down at 2 p.m. Eastern today. The expectation is that the Fed will, in fact, hike rates by about 50 basis points. But a number of things that we're watching today in the lead up to that decision, you just highlighted uh, the yield curve there. And Rochelle, you know, we've been talking so much about sort of the, the inflation data, economic data that's been coming down. But if you've been watching the yield curve really closely, it does point to some of those recession signals that we have come to accept. Where last week we were talking about the widest gulf here between the short and long term yields that we're seeing. Obviously, the yield curve now inverted. Uh, for the last 50 years, it's been a sign of a recession. Certainly, investors are going to be watching that, although we have seen it narrow just a bit. And I wonder if we can just pull up that chart yet again to show you what we are seeing, the difference between the two-year, the 10-year, and the 30-year yield. Something very closely to watch, of course. Uh, expectation is already kind of baked in in terms of where the Fed's likely to move. But to your point, it really will be about the language from the Fed. And I know, Rochelle, you're also watching the impact on the housing sector really closely here because those mortgage rates. We have seen it go up. It's true. I mean, I think investors are really looking for any sort of data points to really get a gauge on what we can expect going into 2023. And as we look at what we've achieved, what the Fed has achieved over the last six rate hikes, as we take a look here, because obviously you have the housing market, but you also have the stubborn labor market, which doesn't seem to be shifting. We saw that with March's first start of that 25 basis point hike, followed by a 50 basis point hike in May, followed by four subsequent 75 jumbo basis point hikes. And as we look at that stickier part of the inflation story, lab the labor market, it started around 4% at the beginning of the year. It's now at around 3.7%, not much movement there. But then when you look at what we've seen with the 30-year fixed mortgage, that started at the beginning of the year at about, about 4% as well. And we see that's currently at about 3.7% about, um, there for, for the labor market. But interest rates at now about six, almost 7% now. They've started to creep down a little bit in November, but started to tick down a little bit further also in December. But that's still double where we were at the start of the year when it was 3%. And we know that mortgage rates is what people are always tending to look for when they see these Fed announcements coming out. And of course, that's not the only big news we have today. The crypto hearing also continuing today. A lot of pressure on the Hill. We'll continue to hear from the CEO of FTX, but also former crypto skeptic turned spokesman and investor Kevin O'Leary. We know that he told CNBC that, you know, they relied on other people's due diligence. But I thought it was interesting because there are a lot of comparisons to Enron, as we saw the FTX CEO bring up yesterday. But Kevin O'Leary in his prepared testimony is expected to say that, look, en Enron came and went and had no impact on the energy markets. Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers demise had no impact on the long term potential of American debt and equity markets. So essentially saying don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You have FTX, but it's not, in his mm -hmm. opinion, going to have contagion to the full crypto industry. Yeah, and we're looking at a live view here of that hearing. Uh, kicked off about an hour ago, and we've already heard from Kevin O'Leary there. But it, it, there's an interesting divide here, Rochelle, that is kind of playing out in this hearing. You heard uh, outgoing 
Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey saying that don't blame crypto. This is about a misuse of funds by a CEO, Sam Bankman Fried. It doesn't mean that we should halt the technology. In fact, it could actually be good for the technology to, to basically have a bit of a shakedown in the sector. Kevin O'Leary making the same case here, saying this doesn't change the promise of crypto. And Ron didn't kill the energy sector, and neither should this kill crypto itself. But interesting comments here coming from Hillary Allen, who's the professor of American University. She's sitting on the very left of the screen there, saying, embezzlement. Yes, that's what it came down to in the case of FTX, but that was able to go undetected because it was crypto. So a bit of a divide in terms of the panelists that are speaking, uh, that are giving testimony here in this hearing, continuing to watch here as we watch uh, Senator John Tester there questioning um, those uh, on the Hill today. A bit of a different focus, Rochelle, we should point out, because yesterday it was about John Ray, who's the now CEO of FTX, testifying as to what he has seen within the company. Today, the focus seems to be a bit more about what happened with FTX, yes, but also what does this mean for the future of crypto? And that, that regulation story is certainly one we'll continue to follow. Well, we'll continue to also preview the final FOMC meeting of the year with our full team coverage. For that, let's bring in Yahoo Finance Fed correspondent Jen Schonberger, as well as our very own Jared Glickery. So, Jen, you're standing by on the ground in Washington, D.C. What can we expect today? Good morning. I am here outside the Federal Reserve where officials are meeting right now in this building behind me and their last policy meeting of 2022. Officials expected to slow down the pace of rate hikes while signaling that they will move their benchmark interest rate higher than previously thought. Officials expected to raise the Fed funds rate by half a percentage point to a new range of four and a quarter to four and a half percent. That would mark the highest level since December 2000. Now, today's meeting likely to usher in a slower phase of rate hikes after the Fed raised rates by a blistering 75 basis points over the past four meetings. That was the fastest pace since the late 1980s. All eyes will be on a new set of interest rate projections, that so-called dot plot, that will clue investors into how much higher the Fed sees raising rates. Fed Chair Powell previously said that rates should rise above the 4.6 percent previously projected in September to cool hot inflation. Investors will also get a new set of projections on the economy, uh, that's GDP, unemployment, and inflation. And with inflation showing signs of cooling, Fed Chair Powell likely to get peppered with questions about whether the Fed could slow down the pace of rate hikes even further, assuming they go by 50 basis points this afternoon, whether they could move to 25 basis point increments. From there, he's likely to be asked also when the Fed expects to stop raising rates. The decision comes down at 2 p.m. That press conference at 2.30 this afternoon. Back to you. Okay, and Jen, I know you'll be all over that. We will, of course, have live coverage of that as well. Thanks so much for that. Well, let's talk markets now. Jared Blickery joining us in studio. Uh, what can we expect, Jared? Um, should Jay Powell deliver a more hawkish tone today? That's right. It comes down to uh, pretty, pretty two simple options here. It can be hawkish or it can be dovish. Now, here's what happens if Powell strikes a slightly hawkish tone. We might be uh, getting indications that the Fed is slower to pivot. In other words, rate hikes are likely to continue longer uh, than expected, so stay higher for longer. And also, risk assets would probably be down uh, flat to down on the day. So that includes stocks, it includes commodities, and also crypto. Pretty interesting that the two big stories of the day are not only Powell, but also that big crypto hearing. Well, Bitcoin has been a leader both to the upside and to the downside uh, when we've had these various decisions. Now, on the flip side, if Powell were to strike a dovish uh, tone, that would indicate that the Fed is quicker to pivot. So in other words, it stops raising rates sooner rather than later. And also risk assets in the scenario, stocks, commodities, crypto, would probably rally. Now, we'd probably get those uh, the fringe assets, I would say crypto and some of those beaten down growth center stocks. Those would probably rise disproportionately uh, higher and faster than some of the other cyclical and value sectors. And uh, on the flip side, if we were to get that hawkish tone, those very same crypto and growth <laughs> tech uh, assets, they would probably go down quicker uh, than some of those cyclical and value. So in a nutshell, it's really simple. Hawkish means that probably the Fed is slower to pivot. And if he's dovish, then quicker to pivot. 
Okay, Jared Blickery sitting on top of the markets for us this morning. Uh, staying with our conversation on today's Fed meeting, let's welcome in Emily Rowland, a co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management. Emily, a big day here as we look to the last meeting of the year or a last decision of the year from the FOMC. We saw yesterday the markets rally a bit on the back of that CPI print that came down, but we did see a bit of a pullback towards the close. What do you want to hear from the Fed chair today? Yeah, Kiko, it's a big day today. Um, we're expecting to see the Fed moving from this pattern of 75 basis points to a 50 basis point rate hike. You know, the state, the summary of economic projections is going to be critical. That's what we're going to be doing, refreshing our screens to see what the Fed says as far as the terminal rate goes. Uh, during the last uh, summary of economic projections, the Fed had showed about 4.6% was what they expected, uh, where they expected to stop in 2023. The bond market is now projecting that the Fed are pricing in a terminal rate of 5%. So does the SEP start to reflect that? And what are the Fed's views on GDP? Uh, last time they penciled in 1.2% uh, for GDP in 2023. It's not hard to see how the economy continues to accelerate, given this incredible amount of tightening that the Fed uh, has uh, put into the system. And finally, we'll be watching, of course, the press conference with bated breath. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Chair Powell pushes against easier financial conditions. The Fed could not be happy with the fact that financial conditions remain really easy still. You've got the dollar weakening down about 5% from its peak. You've got high yield spreads barely budging to reflect elevated recession concerns, and you've got the S&P 500 rallying here. We're only down 14% year to date, and all of that has come from multiple expansions. So we'll be really listening closely to see what the Fed's response is to that. And we know that Powell really did hone in on this issue of wage growth and the tight labor market being really the sort of make or break part of inflation here. Can the Fed, though, successfully bring down inflation at the pace that it wants to when you still have such a tight labor market? Yeah, it's going to be really tough. Every jobs report that comes in is just too hot for the Fed to handle. And we need to see uh, wage growth come down. One of the biggest challenges for the Fed has been the fact that the participation rate really has not gone up. So there's a lot of work that's been done to try to understand, you know, the effect of COVID and how that's impacted the labor force, why people aren't returning to work. And that has been very, very stubborn and a reason that we haven't seen wage growth pressures come down. So I think the Fed's going to reiterate today that there's still a lot of work to do. They have been unwavering in their commitment to bringing down elevated inflation. And yes, we did see a, a nice kind of continuation of the pattern in terms of the pace of uh, uh, the uh, inflation data coming down a bit yesterday. But look, headline CPI still has a seven handle on it. We still have an inflation issue here in the US. We do expect inflationary pressures to subside and do so quickly into 2023. In fact, if you do the math, and we keep on the pace of a 0.1% increase on a month over month basis, you're below 2% by June of next year. The challenge, of course, though, is that the Fed is very much focused on backward looking data. They're looking at unemployment, they're looking at CPI. Those things take time to show up. We look at the leading economic indicators, and they've decelerated for four consecutive months, suggesting that a recession is imminent. Uh, so the Fed is probably going to go too far, too fast here to avoid a recession in 2023. Well, Emily, I mean, to that point, the leading indicators there are really key in sort of guiding the market in terms of where this is likely to move. When you look at where that data is going, I mean, especially if you look at something like the yield curve, what does that suggest in terms of where the terminal rate is likely to end up at? Yeah, it's hard to imagine a yield curve inverted to the tune of 72 basis points, which is where the 210 spread is as of this morning, not leading into a recession. So we do think that the market might be right around 5% terminal rate for the Fed funds, but the bond market is now pricing in two rate cuts in the back half of next year. And we think that's right. Um, you know, the Fed has a dual mandate, as we all know, they set monetary policy based on maximizing employment and maintaining price stability. And they've just been tackling the price stability half of their mandate this year. And we think that that's split next year over to the employment side of their mandate. And the Fed's going to need to be cutting rate, uh, cutting rates as the unemployment rate comes down. Now, the good news is that'll probably mean the start of a new cycle. 
uh, as far as risk assets. We see the Fed start to cut and we could be off to the races again in terms of uh, risk assets starting to do better. Uh, bonds we think will work well in a portfolio. So we think a balanced portfolio is going to be alive and well, uh, but there's probably going to be some choppiness and bumpiness until we can get there. And Emily, you pointed to the potential of two rate hikes next year. When do we expect that to come? Yeah, so the bond market now is pricing in 25 basis points in February and then another 25 in March and then pause. Uh, and then again, those two rate cuts in the back half, September and December of next year. That is a lifetime away. Uh, you know, you look at some of the Fed projections from a year ago and you almost kind of laugh thinking about them. Uh, we never thought that the Fed would tighten uh, to this extent, nor did the Fed uh, itself. So that's still a ways away, but that we think directionally is where the Fed goes into 2023. We'll certainly be listening closely at 2.30 when we get that press conference. A big thank you to Emily yeah. Rowland there, co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management. Thank you. Well, a programming note, we'll have live coverage of that very important Fed decision right here on Yahoo Finance starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss it. All right, looking back at the market, shares of Delta taking off this session on a bullish forecast for next year. The airline saying it expects adjusted earnings to nearly double in 2023, with revenue forecast to jump 15 to 20 percent from this year. CEO Ed Bastian saying that Delta's momentum is building with robust demand for air travel. The company is now reaffirming its target to fully restore its network next year after operating at above 90 percent of 2019 levels for this holiday travel season. All right, coming up, facing the fire. As the Senate asks why the crypto bubble burst, others are still picking up the pieces. We'll ask our next guest if the slow grinding gears of DC are ever going to be fast enough to keep pace with the fast changing industry. In November, Gary Gensler said the SEC would crack down on violations wherever and whenever they happen. Well, some news today echoing those sentiments. The market's regulator has charged eight individuals over an alleged $100 million securities fraud scheme. Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan has the story. Alexis, what's the latest? Hi, Rochelle. Yeah, so it's not just the SEC. There's a parallel complaint filed with criminal charges from the Justice Department. And uh, those two respective cases, they are against seven social media influencers and one podcaster who the agencies say held themselves out as multi-million dollar financial gurus. The agencies claim that these popular stock pickers used Twitter and Discord to promote stocks to hundreds of thousands of followers and then 
Fed would secretly dump those assets when share prices or volumes rose, all they say without telling their followers. So they say that these are violations of securities laws by disseminating false and misleading information about the stocks that they picked. Now, some of these Twitter accounts, they have been or appear to have been taken down. Uh, some of the followers that are named in this uh, these two suits, one is Edward Constantine of Texas. He had about 551 followers on Twitter as of December, along with his uh, co-worker, Perry Matlock. Uh, they have have some creative uh, names that they go under. Uh, the complaints list them as Edward Constantine as AKA Mr. Zach Morris. He goes under that name. Also Matlock going under the name of PJ Matlock on Twitter. He had 340,000 Twitter followers as of December. And the agencies, they both say that these defendants did list disclaimers on their social media accounts saying that this was not stock advice. They should not uh, be, they are not disseminating advice for their followers. But the agency said, look, these defendants they intended for their followers to act on their promotional tweets, and they understood that their followers would do just that. So that's the hook there. They say that they should be accountable for promoting and then dumping these particular stocks. Ms. Keenan, with the very latest on that, thanks so much for that. Well, on Tuesday, Binance temporarily halted withdrawals of stablecoin USDC amid growing investor concerns following the collapse of FTX. Now, CEO Changpeng Zhao is saying the situation has, quote, stabilized at his crypto exchange. CZ reportedly saying in an internal memo that he expects the next several months to be bumpy, but the company will be stronger for having been through it. The Senate hearing on the crypto crash currently underway. We are looking at live images out of Capitol Hill. Investor Kevin O'Leary, who was paid $15 million by FTX to be a spokesperson, among those testifying this morning, take a listen to what he had to say in opening statements. The collapse of FTX is nothing new. While this situation is painful for shareholders, employees, and account holders, in the long run, it does not change this industry's promise. Enron came and went and had no impact on the energy market. Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers' demise had no impact on the long-term potential of American debt and equity markets. Kevin O'Leary adding there that the recent collapse of crypto companies has a bit of a silver lining here. Joining us now is Seth Berenswag, managing partner at Berenswag Leonard. Uh, interesting arguments coming out of this hearing. You heard Kevin O'Leary make <clears throat> that argument there. You also heard Senator Pat Toomey say, look, do you look back at the financial crisis just because there were bad mortgages didn't mean we got rid of mortgages altogether? Do you buy that argument? Well, I think there's some merit to it. I don't think you can throw the baby out with the bathwater. Certainly, there are going to be uh, some, some altcoins that are going to uh, meet their final demise. Uh, but make no mistake about it, Washington has declared war on crypto. That was apparent through the House Financial Services Committee hearing yesterday, as well as the Senate Banking Committee today. And while there is some divergence of opinion and uh, some differences certainly between the Republicans and Democrats, you can see that there is really going to be a, a widespread attack. And as has happened through yesterday and today, basically everybody is throwing Sam Bankman-Fried uh, under the bus. SVF was, they loved him, now they hate him. Uh, yesterday, they didn't just throw him under the bus, they threw him under a fleet of buses. And I think Washington really feels very flat-footed right now because it was just a couple of weeks ago that SBF was on Capitol Hill. He was the darling of the committees. He was supposedly the protector of, uh, of consumers. And now we have this, th this huge fleece that we have uncovered. So I think that has really caused some consternation and grief in Washington. Now there's going to be the pendulum swinging to the other side. Is, is it fair to say that there is a war declared on crypto? I mean, we heard Pat Toomey today say, don't get rid of crypto. This is not the reason to do that. Remember, the focus is on Sam Bankman-Fried. This isn't about the assets that were in place. It's about how those assets were used. That's exactly right. And I think that the, the issue with that, though, is that I think there is a minority. There, there, there are different fractions in Congress. There are certainly uh, conflicts that are going on right now. There are some that want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and there are others that are saying that we really just need to attack what the problems are and just excise that out of the system. But the problem right now is that the regulators are so far behind 
that even if you take a look at the litigation that's going on right now, there's going to be a huge clarion call to have a complete reshuffling of the decks and, and what's going on in terms of regulation. You have to have a scorecard to keep track of all the new litigation that's going on. You have the FTX bankruptcy case, you have the SDNY criminal case, um, you have the SEC administrative enforcement case. Ironically, Kevin O'Leary is a defendant in a Miami federal class action case uh, with a whole parade of celebrities. So yes, I think that you are right that there are some voices on Capitol Hill that are going to have a voice of reason. And I think that that's the correct thing to do, but there's going to be a lot of heavy debate and a new flood of hearings and legislation because certainly something has to be done on this terrain. And Seth, it's interesting because on the one hand, you sort of have this regulatory vacuum and now you have multiple agencies all jumping in at the same time with different uh, civil and criminal charges. How does this play out in terms of the regulators who really still haven't defined certain crypto assets right now? Well, that's exactly right. And I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of what the problem is. You know, does the SEC in fact have jurisdiction um, over cryptocurrency? Is it really a security? Keep in mind that we don't even have basic regulation with regard to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, basic stable coins as they have to be footed to the dollar. The problem that, uh, that really lies underneath this is that technology always outraces bureaucracy. And there's really going to be a huge catch-up game right now. I don't believe that crypto is dead. I think crypto is going to be with us for a long time. There's going to be a dramatic change uh, because we really have uh, just a whole cacophony of voices right now in Washington that really got caught flat footed. And there will be changes. Um, they're going to be really playing catch up, but there has to be new regulation. Hopefully they won't be going in too deep. But I agree with you that they are behind and that they will make some significant changes. But crypto and blockchain will certainly be with us. But make no mistake about it. We're just going to have to buckle up and be ready for a lot of hearings and a lot of turbulence coming up over the coming months, especially here in Washington. What about the enforcement of existing regulations that are already on the books? Well, uh, some of the laws that are already on the books, um, frankly, still really don't answer a lot of the questions of what's going on right now. And frankly, the, there was a letter that was disclosed in the hearing yesterday uh, where the Republicans were chastising the Securities and Exchange Commission for not going uh, too strong against the uh, crypto exchanges because they didn't want to inhibit their freedom of operation. So there's going to be um, a discussion of what's really not only the enforcement within the SEC, but what are the basic kinds of regulations that have to be put into place? Keep in mind, there really is a void because business really uh, is running at a much faster pace than Congress. But the hearings will be talking a lot about what has to be done. Um, and, and unfortunately, the hearing yesterday was really a lot more on glitz and, uh, and really throwing Sam under the bus, but really not talking much on substance. But you'll hear a lot of that coming up in January. And certainly something that might require some global coordination as different countries try and manage this as well. A big thank you to Seth Berenzweg there. Berenzweg, Leonard, managing partner, thank you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. All right, well, staying in the crypto world, let's take a look at shares of Coinbase in rally mode right now. Now, this is, of course, as Bitcoin climbs above 18,000 for the first time since November 10th. But it's been a rough year for Coinbase. The stock is down over 80 percent year to date. All right, stay with us. Coming up, when the chips are down, the Biden administration reportedly adding a boatload more Chinese companies to a trade blacklist. Is this just more tit for tat jockeying or a deepening divisions forming? We'll discuss next.
Well, in ongoing tensions between the U.S. and China, the Biden administration is expected to add more than 30 Chinese companies to its trade blacklist. That includes China's top memory chip maker, Yangtze Memory, or YMTC. Uh, this is all according to a report out of Bloomberg. The move would prevent the companies from buying certain American parts unless they get a special export license from the Commerce Department. China's foreign ministry spokesperson saying that the U.S. is, quote, politicized and weaponized economic cooperation, adding that China would take steps to protect the rights of its companies. And to understand how devastating this could likely be, Rochelle, look no further than what happened with Huawei, because this is exactly what happened uh, back in 2019 when the U.S. government essentially said, you can't do deals with Google anymore, and that uh, prevented them from doing any kind of 5G technology. So no question, this is really just upping the ante. But you could argue a company like YMTC is kind of been anticipating this for a while. Uh, they were placed under heavy export controls back in October. These reports that Apple had already certified these 3D uh, NAND memory chips um, to source them in uses of iPhones that were sold in China. They have since pivoted out of that. Um, but, you know, you we were talking about this yesterday, that, that China has now reportedly crafted a plan to try and be more self-sufficient. The question is, can they keep up with the rest of the competition globally in the face of all of these headwinds? And I mean, we don't usually see this sort of tit for tat happen so quickly just after China filed that dispute with the WTO. And it really does harken back to when we saw the sort of tariff standoff at the beginning with, with, during the Trump administration. Every day it was, you know, more, more uh, restrictions, different tariffs. And that ended up essentially in something all a standstill, even though they were able to come up with a phase one trade deal. But here we are again, except this time it's with the future, the essential future of people's economies. The, what's going to power that next growth in the economy? We know that We've talked about chips being the cornerstone for China, really growing its economy as well, wanting this sort of high tech supply chain to boost the economy to the next level. At the same time, Biden has made it very clear with the CHIPS Act and then the additional restrictions in the U.S. in October that they're not going to put up, that they're going to continue to put up a fight here. So I think we're going to be continuing to see a lot of this tit for tat. But you have the two biggest economies very interconnected. We have countries having to pick sides. So this latest escalation, I, I don't think this is going to go anytime soon. I'm not sure at what point this comes to a head when people have to pick sides. But when you think of what goes into a chip, there are so many different countries involved. No country can be an island when it comes to chip manufacturing. But, but the timing of this, I, th I think, is really key, because when you think about somebody like Yangtze Memory, I mean, th 3D NAND memory chips is what they're known for. And there has been reporting out there that they are starting to pick up momentum here so they can ultimately compete with the likes of Samsung and SK Hynix. The U.S. is essentially trying to cut their feet off uh, at that time when they're trying to build momentum there. And, and so you have to wonder exactly the timing of this. But, you know, Rochelle, you mentioned that this tit for tat, the Biden administration, whether it is uh, through the national security side, the State Department, they have all been signaling that semiconductors are at the center of these national security concerns. So you can certainly, if you take their word, I mean, this is just really the beginning in that the administration is certainly looking to up the ante uh, against some of these companies who are really trying to compete on a global level. It certainly doesn't look like they can do that, at least in the immediate term, if they don't have the equipment coming in from Western countries right. and if they don't have the technology being imported. And I mean, a lot of analysts that we've spoken to say, look, the U.S. at the moment does not have a China policy. So when you sort of factor everything in, if you're factoring in now geopolitics with, with high tech here, I think even though they did have a sort of they had a conversation to sort of reset the tone. But this is still a, a pretty not a combative relationship, but it's a very competitive relationship. They need each other, but that competition is there. And so I think this is going to be a difficult one to play. We'll have to see who blinks first. Obviously, the ante keeps getting raised, so something we'll continue to keep an eye on. All right, coming up, Europe taking a bite out of Apple. We know the smartphone giant makes the lion's share of its revenue from handsets, but the EU's latest battle against big tech could threaten to eat into profits. We'll discuss next.
China's sudden reversal of its zero COVID policy has created its own set of problems, with a shift from strict lockdowns over Omicron's deadliness to now abandoning tracking of the ongoing surge. Meanwhile, cases still rising in the country as restrictions are lifted. Here with more is Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani. Anjali, what's the latest? That's right, Rochelle. Unfortunately, what we're looking at right now in China is a mixed bag of definitely rising cases, but an inability to track just how severe that case rise is, with China rolling back on tracking of their uh, residents through apps, as well as reducing the number of testing sites available. Uh, it's become harder to understand what the picture is there. Uh, but we do know that there are uh, there is definitely a, a rate rise in cases. There have also also been measures to help with those who get sick, such as fever clinics in remote areas. And all that painting a picture of, uh, you know, China's shift in tone in what to expect from COVID. We know that Omicron has been, while more transmissive, a little bit less deadly for a larger population, especially, especially those that are vaccinated. China does not have that same level of vaccination, but we have heard a, a message about comparing Omicron to the flu. Uh, from one of the top officials there. So that is sort of the, currently the picture uh, in China. A huge pivot, at least in rhetoric, uh, but it's interesting to see the reaction there um, to what has been a significant change in policy. Anjali Kamlani, thanks so much for that. Well, now to our chart of the day, domestic flight activity in China is taking off. That's according to aviation data company Veriflight. It reported that flight activity soared to 65% of pre-pandemic levels at the beginning of the week, from 29% roughly two weeks ago, the equivalent of thousands of flights per day returning to the air. The rebound comes, as Anjali mentioned, after Beijing ditched its strict zero COVID policy. Chinese travel agency Ctrip found that air travel searches jumped 900% on December 7th, when the Chinese government dismantled those restrictions. Well, let's now turn to another aspect of trade in Asia. The big question here we've been asking for a few years now, will the U.S. reconsider trade agreements in the region? A new bipartisan report from the Asia Society proposing changes to the CPTPP, or the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, that might increase U.S. support for rejoining while still serving as a potential check on China. Let's bring in Wendy Cutler, Asia Society Policy Institute Vice President. Uh, Wendy, it's been an interesting journey when you think about where the TPP was, how long it's been the U.S. pulling out under President Trump. Now you've got this report that you have penned essentially with somebody who was within the Trump administration about potentials for joining. What does that outline look like? So our view is that it's time for us to relook and rethink about re-entry into this trade pact, which is now in place among 11 countries without us. We feel that things have changed in the region, in the United States, since we withdrew from TPP six years ago. And frankly, we're losing our economic competitiveness in the region, as well as our economic influence in the region. And so what would the U.S. rejoining do, given obviously what we're seeing with some of these regional agreements like RCEP coming into play? It would give us a seat at the table to help shape the rules for trade and investment going forward. Countries are doing it without us, including China. I think we're losing out there. And we're also losing out from all the tariff cuts and supply chain connectivities these countries are forging through these agreements. And so I think it's something worth considering. Um, I have no doubt it, it's going to be difficult, but I think it's time to restart that conversation. Wendy, when you think about the opposition to the original TPP, it wasn't just Republicans. There were Democrats like Bernie Sanders who were also opposed to it. So what specifically, what specific changes are you proposing to the existing trade pact that you think will get Democrats and Republicans back on board? Mm -hmm. And remember, since we left the TPP, Congress overwhelmingly supported and voted in the USMCA, which is the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which improved the original NAFTA. So some of the suggestions in our report come directly from the USMCA, which was embraced by the progressive part of the Democratic Party, including stronger rules on labor, the environment, on rules of origin, on digital trade. So again, we think things have changed over the past six years. 
Uh, Wendy, we were just showing uh, member countries uh, that are part of CPTPP right now. You've also got China applying for uh, membership earlier this year. When you talk about these potential changes that will get American lawmakers on board, what's the likelihood that these members will say, sure, you know, we're on board with those changes too? Again, uh, it's going to be a tough road ahead, but I do have confidence given that the USMCA came into effect, voted on by Congress at a, in, on a, in a bipartisan way with a lot of votes. Um, and so um, it gives me optimism about um, a TPP, a revised TPP for the United States in the future. We're also engaged right now in the Indo-Pacific economic framework negotiations with um, 13 other partners in the region. And our view is the IPEF also could be something that could be built on through the revisions we suggest um, in our paper. And Wendy, what do you see as the biggest headwinds for getting some of these things that you'd like to see in their past, given the sort of the appetite we have right now for a lot of domestic policy in the US really taking focus right now? Yeah, again, there's just domestic headwinds against trade in general. Polling suggests that um, the US is slowly coming back to recognizing the benefits of trade, particularly during all the supply chain um, disruptions we experienced during COVID. Um, but also, I think there's a recognition that we need to do more at home to enhance our competitiveness to help those left behind trade um, um, to have sufficient opportunities for adjustment. And many of those kind of tools need to be affected through domestic policies, not through trade agreements. So through domestic policies and through trade agreements, we think they should go hand in hand. Wendy Cutler, Asia Society Policy Institute Vice President. Good to have you on the show today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, coming up, it's been a difficult year for Apple with major production woes in China, but is the EU about to add to the pain for the tech group? We'll discuss next. Apple is reportedly planning to allow third-party app stores on its iPhones and iPads in the EU as the block continues what some would say is a crackdown on the world's most powerful tech groups. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley is here. Uh, Dan, uh, we're talking about a crackdown that has really been about antitrust, anti-competition. To what extent is this kind of move 
likely to assuage some of those concerns? Uh, it could uh, be really kind of a salve for this uh, ongoing problem that Apple is facing, not just here in the U.S., but uh, abroad. In the EU in particular, uh, they introduced a law called the Digital Markets Act, and it goes into effect uh, in 2024, or companies have to comply by 2024. And when it comes to Apple in particular, uh, they may have to start allowing for third-party app stores, be uh, allowing them to be installed on iPhone uh, and uh, other iOS devices, so your iPhone, your iPad, things along those lines. That's a huge shift from what we have right now, where you can only install apps via the App Store. Apple has been adamant about that being a, a key reason why its devices are so secure. Uh, opening that up, they say, uh, will increase the opportunity for spam uh, apps or uh, malicious apps to be installed on users' devices. That said, uh, companies have said that that disadvantages them because uh, if they're selling something, Apple gets that 30% or 15% cut of sales. So this would allow those companies to then offer their own services through third-party app stores uh, and get them installed uh, on Apple's devices. How that impacts Apple's bottom line, though, that's kind of still up in the air. And in 2021, uh, for instance, Apple saw $20.7 billion in services revenue of its $365.8 billion in total revenue. Services revenue, by the way, uh, is inclusive of the App Store as well as uh, other things like Apple One subscriptions, um, Apple Music Plus, Apple TV Plus, things like that. They don't really break it out evenly to give you a good sense of how much the App Store is really generating. But you know, if you see people start going away from the App Store, uh, they're not getting that 30% cut anymore, that could be a problem. Oh, and by the way, Apple's boosting its advertising business, and part of that is ads you see on the App Store. So if fewer eyeballs are on the App Store, that means potentially less ad revenue going forward. Uh, Dan, really quickly, I mean, this is in the EU, but what about these concerns that exist in the U.S.? I mean, are U.S. lawmakers likely to look at what Apple's doing in the EU and say, okay, you know, maybe they're starting to address this? Yeah, you know, that, that could be something that we do see. Um, you know, the, the EU obviously has the new uh, standard where Apple's going to have to use USB-C on their iPhones. They'll likely start uh, introducing those in the U.S. as well, just because it makes more sense as far as hardware goes. Software, on the other hand, they may not have to make any changes to the App Store here in the U.S. and in other countries. The U.S. is still Apple's largest market, so if they can get those that 30% that cut uh, from app developers uh, and continue to do that here in the U.S., not in the EU, then they might not have to change anything. Still, uh, we've seen lawmakers here in the U.S. discuss uh, the issues with antitrust. Uh, there is an investigation, according to Politico, uh, that the DOJ has undertaken into Apple and potential antitrust abuses as far as the App Store goes. So, you know, if they want to avoid uh, that kind of uh, black mark that they would get uh, if such a suit was filed, then they could essentially just launch the same idea here in the U.S. Uh, they'd likely caveat it saying, you know, they can't guarantee the safety of apps there, or okay. uh, they could go ahead and verify apps uh, on their own, which is a suggestion uh, that could uh, happen going forward. But, you know, it, it's still up in the air as to whether or not it happens here in the U.S. Yeah. as well. Okay, Dan Halley, thanks so much for that. Well, coming up, humankind has been stuffing food into grain-based flatbread since 10,000 B.C., but... It wasn't until 1961 that a humble man in San Francisco claimed, we should stress claim to have sold the first retail burrito. Now it's America's cuisine. Find out why next.
Well, Grubhub is out with its sixth annual trends report. The delivery giant broke down its top orders in 2022. Brooke De Palma is here with the details. Brooke, you know, I always like an excuse to talk about food, especially at this hour. But burritos? <laughs> Burritos. burritos being the top. That's right, Akiko. Burritos is the most ordered item on Grubhub in 2022. Customers flocking to burritos, choosing the option to customize as well as grab it on the go. That was the major pull there, making it number one, a total of four million burritos once again, either ordering everything from sour cream and guac to sausage and eggs. As you can see there, cheeseburgers coming in at number two at two million orders. So far behind that burrito. And ultimately, if you take a look at this top 10, not in it, impossible. Possible foods. That was actually number one, their burger last year in 2021, but also making that list boneless wings, Caesar salad, fried chicken sandwich. Of course, we've seen so many try to get in on that. But if you take a look at the dipping sauces that customers opted in the past year, ketchup, ranch, buffalo sauce, honey mustard, and spicy mustard making the top five. But Akiko, for you in LA, the top sauce is actually buffalo sauce. Not sure if you agree with that one. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Buffalo sauce, huh? maybe a little spicier, a little bit. Spicier. I don't know, Rochelle. You, Rochelle, you wanna, you wanna chime in here? <laughs> well, you know, you know, in the DC area, we like mambo sauce. We, we mm. like something a, li a little bit spicy and sweet. A, a, a good mix of that. I am shocked that Caesar salads made the cut. Like. Of all the things you can order, all that good, greasy, cheesy, and then Caesar salad made it in there. I, I am shocked. Um, but Brooke, I do want to ask you about um, the breakfast and coffee orders. Americans do seem to be particular about that. What did Grubhub find there? Yeah, well, ordering coffee to go. I mean, we were a bit skeptical this morning, but it turns out so many Americans are doing it. If you take a look at the top breakfast order, you have sausage, egg, and cheese sandwiches, donuts. You have sausage burritos, like we mentioned before. But actually here in New York City, keeping to what locals know best, the bagels was the top ordered item in 2022. But coffee to go was also a big pull here. Number one there, iced coffee over hot. We also saw iced caramel coffee, iced French vanilla coffee, as well as frozen coffee coffee even, which I'm not sure how that stays frozen while being delivered, but quite interesting as well. Denver actually overtaking New York City as the top early bird breakfast orders between the hours of 5 hmm. to 8 a.m. Eastern. In addition to that, oat milk was the top milk alternative here, overtaking almond milk by four to one ratio. So oat milk becoming more and more popular here. Uh, Brooke, this is what I, I wish we had like a control room camera because I want to know how many of those orders came from our producer Val, oh who by the way does <laughs> a do delivery for <laughs> coffee, right? Iced coffee, almond milk, we know her order, but uh, interesting take here and you can read all about it and Brooke's article on our website, yahoofinance.com. Thanks so much for that, Brooke. Uh, well, let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go, because we are, of course, counting down to the big Fed decision this afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. We've got the Dow up more than 200 points right now, the S&P 500 up 23. We, of course, will have special coverage for you around that Fed decision starting right here on Yahoo Finance at 2 p.m. Eastern. You certainly don't want to miss that. That does it for Rochelle and I in this hour. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance Live. Keep it right here.